Hey guys, welcome back to the Great Books Lecture Series. Today we're going to be discussing topics on the Red Book. Um, this is a very detailed book, so I'm splitting up this episode into three parts. Liber Primus, Liber Secundus, and probably the Scrutinies. And... Um, Right off the bat, this is Young's Imaginative Manuscript, number one, book one. So this is the first book. And um, if you guys don't know, this is Carl Gustav Jung. He's a Swiss psychiatrist and psychoanalyst who founded analytical psychology. Jung's work was mostly influenced by Sigmund Freud, and he was a student of Friedrich Nietzsche. All right, so I'm going to start off by reading an introduction to the book. Uh, this is an essay I'll link in the description of the video. We'll start with the definition. So the Red Book is an exquisite red leather bound folio manuscript crafted by the Swiss psychologist and physician Carl Gustav Jung between 1915 and about 1913, recounts and comments upon the author's imaginative, imaginative experiences between 1913 and 1916, and is based on manuscripts first drafted by Young in 1914 to 1915 and 1917. Despite being nominated as a central work in Young's Ouvre, it was not published or made otherwise accessible for study until 2009. While the work has in past years been descriptively called the Red Book, Young did emboss a formal title on the folio spine. He entitled the, book, the work Liber Novus, the new book. So... I'm going to talk about a little bit about the composition and publication. So Liber Novus contains a literary and artistic recension of what has been called Jung's con confrontation with the unconscious, an intense period of imaginative activity accompanied by waking visions that began in 1913 and continued with variable intensity for about six years. In his biographical memoir, Jung clearly announced the centrality of these events to his life work. So Jung stated when he spoke to Jaffe, Aniela Jaffe in 1957, the years when I pursued the inner images were the most important time of my life. Everything else is to be derived from this. Everything later was merely the outer classification, the scientific elaboration, and the integration into life. But the numinous beginning, which contained everything, was then. Numinous meaning containing divinity. So nonetheless, throughout his life, and for nearly half a century after his death, the details of what happened during the period remained a mystery. Lacking access to Young's own primary records, historians, biographers, and critics struggled to contextualize or understand these seminal years of activity and their profound influence upon his later work. So C.G. Young kept an extensive and detailed record of his imag imaginative or visionary experiences, an endeavor he initially referred to as my most difficult experiment. First, there was six sequentially dated journals known as the Black Books, so named because of their black covers, which he began on the night of the 12th of November 1913 and continued recording through the early 1920s. The journals are the records of his experiments and might be described as his contemporaneous leisure leisure of a voyage of discovery into an imaginative inner world. In Liber Novus, he explains, this inner world is truly infinite. 
in no way poorer than the outer one. Man lives in two worlds. During the initial months of fantasy activity, Jung conceived of his activity as primarily referent to his personal situation. After the outbreak of World War I in August 1914, an event presaged in visions. Jung had recorded during the prior winter the magnitude and meanings of his experience constellated in a broader context. What he had endured apparently had more than personal import. It was a reflection of crucial cultural moment, of a crucial cultural moment, and it needed formal record. He began that record by compiling an approximately 1,000 page draft manuscript detailing the initial flood of imaginative material recorded in his black books. Between 19... Uh, 13 and 1914 adding further reflections on its meaning with this protein draft at hand he next turned to creating an enduring testament to his experience with a prodigious artistic craft employing antique illuminated calligraphy and stunning imagery he labored for 16 years translating the manuscript records of his experiences into an elegant folio-sized leather-bound volume. This is the red book titled Liber Novus, the new book. Despite his extended labors on the transcription and accompanying symbolic artwork, the book was never finished. Only approximately two-thirds of the text Young compiled was transcribed into the red book. The remainder survives in his manuscripts. Young did not record Liber Novus as a private aesthetic pretension, he clearly addressed it to the readers in some future time. Through from the beginning, he was oh, though from the beginning, he was never quite sure when that time might come. During his life, Young eventually allowed only a handful of students and colleagues to examine the work. After his death in 1961, his heirs refused all requests for access to the Red Book. And related materials. Finally, in 2009, with full co cooperation of Young's estate, and after 13 years of exhaustive editorial work by Dr. Sony Shamdasani, the Red Book, Liber Novus, was published in a full size facsimile edition, complete with an English translation. The co concluding. Sorry. The concluding portions of manuscripts not transcribed into the Red Book volume, a comprehensive introduction and over 1,500 editorial notes, including excerpts from Young's Black Book Journals and other previously unknown contemporaneous documents. Editions in multiple languages soon followed, in some publication of the Red Book, Lira Novus, signaled the watershed moment in the understanding of the life and work of C.G. Young. In its light, Young's legacy is undergoing an intense reconsideration. So, just a few notes. If you consider buying the Red Book, buy the folio edition, which costs about 150 US dollars, and I believe like almost like over 200 Canadian dollars as it contains the artworks which the reader edition does not. And the reader's edition can cost about 25 or 20 US dollars, probably like 40 something Canadian dollars. So the images um, put a lot of artists to shame. Uh, they're very interesting. And I think uh, without the images, you're not gonna get the full experience of his imagination. So, by the time the Red Book was written, Young had already worked for about 15 years doing psychology. He worked with many psychotic patients, so he had an understanding of the unconscious before going in. So you can imagine Dr. Gustav Young um, as a psychiatrist dealing with a bunch of crazy people. Um, and then 
him himself having visions following his um practice um because he was already practicing psychiatry he kind of understood what was going on and he used his own um his, his himself as an experiment and um the red book is what resulted from his experiments freud insisted on a materialistic materialistic view on life logos and that plays out in mental health in north america so nowadays we have a bunch of people getting diagnosed um prescriptions when they have problems this is um due to logos uh, western western society's understanding of rules and um and order so if you go to a psychologist today they will probably prescribe you meds um we should probably rethink the purely logos approach because people get addicted to these pharmaceutical drugs and um what you find is great artists um die due to opioid addictions right so what deaf psychology helps people see is their problems at a deeper level in order to package up their neuroses um young didn't believe in being able to cure someone of neuroses but if they don't cure you they will at least put your problems over in a corner of your psyche where it won't bother you so much and this is deaf psychology is more of an eros approach and I'll talk more about eros soon All right, so the threshold of vision. A comprehensive understanding of Liber Novus requires consideration of the singular visionary activity underlying the text. The hermeneutic hermeneutic method employed in translating these imagine, imaginative experiences to literary form the signal th- the signal themes emerging from the book as a whole and the I- influence of the entire project on young subsequent work sorry <clears throat> so hermeneutic meaning a study of the methodological methodological principles of interpretation as of the bible So among these tasks understanding what young experience in his waking dreams or visions the imaginative activity that is the foundation to Liber Novus is perhaps the primary and most difficult one for several years prior to 1913 Jung's interest had focused on the evidence he saw in myths dreams fantasies and psychotic delusions of an autonomous myth making function inherently underlying human consciousness so the psyche the soul seemingly expressed itself in an arcane language of myth and symbol to further understand the psyche young recognized the need to investigate this mythopoetic substratum of consciousness during the same period he was increasingly disillusioned with theoretical constructs about the origin and nature of unconscious contents a disenchantment that led to termination of his 6-year misadventure with freud as he explained in the draft manuscript of liber liber novus speaking of his situation around this, this time i had to accept that what i had previously called my soul was not at all my soul but a dead system that had contrived that i had contrived so here um he's talking when we mentioned freud um young and freud had um a split where um freud didn't believe um that religion played in a significant role in in um the unconscious or the psyche 
Um, he believed that myths were important, but he didn't necessarily believe that religion itself had a, uh, what was the word, like a divine meaning. So, around the beginning of 1913, Young noted growing internal turmoil. This crested in October of 1913 when he was overcome by the spontaneous and detailed visions of a monstrous, monstrous flood of blood covering all of Northern Europe or up to the Alps. The same vision recurred two weeks later and again lasted for about an hour. So we're going to talk about that coming up. The eruption of two visual hallucinations pretending vast death and destruction caused Young to fear that he was menaced with psychosis. Over the next weeks, he outwardly surveyed his situation, seeking some therapeutic or palliative insight. Finding none, he determined to search inward. And so, on the evening of the 12th of November 1913, Young sat at his desk, opened his journal, and addressed the mystery, petitioning, petitioning him. My soul, where are you? Do you hear me? I speak, I call you. Are you there? I have returned. I am here again. I have shaken the dust of all the lands of my feet, from my feet, and I have come to you. I am with you. After long years of long wanderings, I have come to you again. So there's a few more notes. This is not within the context of concepts, which is logos, right? Um, when you're talking about visions, um, they're alive. So essentially, Logos is working with con concepts that are dead. Um, in order to have meaning of concepts, you have to put meaning into them. So Leonardo da Vinci has a quote, He who has access to the fountain does not go to the water jar. So Da Vinci would call the water jar logos. Um, this is what's happening when you're listening to this video essay, right? It's just a concept. I'm literally just reading word. And um, so word is a part of logos. You have to put arrows into it. Um, you have to decide the meaning of this essay and what it means to you. So this journal entry begins the record that became Libra Novus, but the course then before him was obscure. He had no theory or concept to explain what he was doing, whom he was addressing, or how he should proceed. He determined to simply let things happen let the unconscious have a voice. During 25 subsequent evenings, he practiced turning off outward consciousness and engaged and engaging any awaiting unconscious contents. Slowly, responses began to come. Finding voice through him, he explained, sometimes it was as if I were hearing it with my ears sometimes feeling it with my mouth, as if my tongue were formulating words. Now and then I heard myself whispering out loud. By early December 1913, Jung discovered that his focused imaginative activity could evoke autonomous visionary scenes, personages, and dialogic interactions. The initial vision is recorded in his journal on the 12th of December, 1913, and recounted in Libra Novus. The speeder of the deaths opened my eyes, and I caught a glimpse of the inner things, the world of my soul. 
the many formed and many change, changing. So if you ever had some interesting dreams, this is exactly what Jung is referring to, that inner world in you. And um, in the introduction to Libra Novus, Dr. Sham Dasani, the person who put uh, Libra Novus together, further explains from December 19, and it took him 13 years, by the way, to put the Red Book together. So from December 1913 onward, he carried on in the same procedure, deliberately evoking a fantasy in a waking state, and then entering it into it as into a drama. These fantasies may be understood as a type of dramatized thinking in pictorial form. In retrospect, he recalled that his scientific question was to see what took place when he switched off consciousness. The example of dreams indicated the existence of background activity, and he wanted to give his give this a possibility of emerging, just as one does when taking masculine. So yeah, you can really kick into kick in the door of your unconscious world per se when you take psychedelics. I know what's happened to me. Um, I would uh, be very cautious when dealing with uh, psychedelics because the same thing can be experienced without them. It's just, you know, your own journey. Um, do as you please. So with almost nightly frequency through January 1914 and then more sporadically until the early summer of 1914, young volitionally engage visual fantasies or visions. He recorded about 35 major visionary episodes in his journals during this period. These accounts, along with commentary appended the next years, comprise the first and second sections, Libra Primus and Libra Secundus of Libra Novus. The majority of this material was recorded into the red leather folio, a final section compiled in 1917 entitled Scrutinies as Account of a Second Period of Visionary Activity Between Late 1915 and 1916. This last section exists in draft manuscript and contains Young's summary, Revelation to Libra Novus, The Septum Sermons, and Mortuus, The Seven Sermons to the Dead. Independently, titled and pri privately put printed by Young in 1916. These summary sermons comprise a vast cosmogenic myth and are the only portion of Libra Novus disclosed and distributed by Young during his lifetime. All right, so Logos. In the beginning was the word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In Christology, the Logos is the name or title of Jesus Christ. It means word, discourse, or reason. Logos is the principle of logic and structure, traditionally associated with spirit, the Father, world, and the God image, the Imago Dei. There's no consciousness without discrimination of opposites. This is the paternal principle, the Logos, which eternally struggles to extricate from the primal warmth and the primal darkness of the maternal womb in a world from unconsciousness. In Jung's earlier writings, he intuitively equ equated masculine consciousness with the concept of Logos, and feminine consciousness with that of Eros. Either one could be dominant in a particular man or woman due to the contrasexual complexes. So by logos, I meant discrimination, judgment, insight. And by Eros, I meant the, capac the capacity to relate. I regarded both concepts as intuitive ideas which cannot be defined 
accurately or exhaustively. From the scientific point of view, this is regrettable, but from a practical one, it has its value, since the two concepts mark out a field of experience which it is equally difficult to define. As we can hardly ever make a psychological proposition without immediately having to reverse it, instances to the contrary leap to the eye at once. Men who care nothing for discrimination, judgment, and insight, and women who display an almost excessively masculine proficiency in this respect, wherever this exists, we find a forcible intrusion of the unconscious, a corresponding corresponding exclusion of the consciousness specific to either sex predominance of the shadow and of contrasexuality all right so eros what is eros where love reigns there is no will there is no will to power and where the will to power is paramount love is lacking Eros, in Greek mythology, is the personification of love, a cosmogenic force of nature, psychologically the function of relationship. Woman's consciousness is characterized more by the connective quality of Eros than by the discrimination and cognition associated with Logos. In men, Eros is usually less developed than Logos, women on the other hand eros is an expression of their true nature while their logos is often only a regrettable accident cupid is often depicted with a bow and arrow he had the power to shoot love wherever he wanted to go so that's um um cupid he's carrying on this bow and arrow um so sin is a um, archery term which means to miss the aim so to be an eros essentially you're not you're not sinning you you hit the spot all the time um your nature is let's see here your nature is um unquestionable So, Eros is a questionable fellow and will always remain so. He belongs on one side to man's primordial primordial animal nature, which will endure as long as man has an animal body. On the other side, he is related to the highest form of the spirit, but he thrives only when spirit and instinct are in right harmony. The Eros Theory So, where love reigns, there is no will to power. And where the will to power is paramount, love is lacking. The one is but the shadow of the other. The man who adopts the standpoint of Eros finds his compensatory opposite in the will to power, and that of the man who puts in the accent on power is Eros. So essentially, we're trying to find a a balance between the two of these. You cannot have one without the other. Um... Logos is essentially forethought, and Eros is feeling. Um, I suggest for men to ask yourself, how do I feel when you're doing certain, certain things? Oftentimes, we're unaware of how we feel, and it directly reflects uh, how, how far into individuation we are. If you're... Un- uh, very unconscious of how you feel um, your forethought um, takes over and you cannot feel anything when you're thinking and you cannot think when you feel if that makes sense it's almost paradoxical in that sense so here I have a um, quick glimpse of Young's model of the psyche which I showed in my um, Collective Works, Volume 9, 1, Lecture. Um, Young's Red Book was a part of his individuation process. So, right, we have the two. We are trying to balance these two opposing forces. Um, the two centers. So, 
Just a quick recap. The ego, according to Jung, represents the conscious mind as it comprises the thoughts, memories, and emotions a, per a person is aware of. The ego is largely responsible for feelings of identity and continuity. In the shadow, the shadow is either an unconscious aspect of the personality that the conscious ego does not identify in itself or the entirety of the unconscious. Example, everything of which a person is not fully conscious of, in short, is the shadow, the unknown side. And then we have the anima and the animus, right? I kind of talked about it in the past, but um, it's pretty much the relating function. And the persona is the social face the individual presents in the world, to the world. It's a kind of mask. Um... So now we're going to begin the prologue to the Red Book. Um, it's called The Way of What is to Come. And um, for most of these chapters, I used paintings by William Blake, except for this chapter. This is um, a painting of Isaiah. I'm not sure who it's by. I forgot to um, put a source underneath. But um, pretty much um, the Red Book starts off with a conversation between um, Isaiah and John. So I'll begin this passage and I want you guys to try and put meaning into what I'm reading, uh, the Eros. Try and feel, try and get a sense of what you're feeling when I read it, because um, I don't want you guys to just take away um, the the rules of, there's no rules um, allocated in this whole manuscript, it's mostly, um, it's mostly imagination. So, Isaiah said, who hath believed or report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form, nor comeliness. Comeliness. And we shall see him. There is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Um, here's a quote from uh, a verse from Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So John replied, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the, gor the glory as of only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1, 14. All right, so Young transcripted this in Latin, so it's all translated. Isaiah then said, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom at the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall water break out, and streams in the desert, and the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water, and the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes, and in a and in a and an highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. 
the unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the wayfaring men through fools shall not err therein. Uh, so now this is a um, passage written by Young. If I speak in the spirit of this time, I must say, no one and nothing can justify what I must proclaim to you. Justification is superfluous to me, since I have no choice, but I must. I learned that in addition to the spirit of this time, there is still another spirit at work, namely that which rules the deaths of the depths of everything contemporary. The spirit of this time would like to hear us hear of use and value. I also thought this way and my humanity still thinks this way. But that other spirit forces me nevertheless to speak beyond justification, use and meaning, filled with human pride and blinded by the presumptuous spirit of this time. I long sought to hold that other spirit away from me, but I did not consider it consider that the spirit of the deaths from time Memorial, and for all the future possessors, or possesses a greater power than the spirit of this time, who changes with the generations. The spirit of the deaths has subjugated all pride and arrogance to the power of judgment. He took away the belief in science. He robbed me of the joy of explaining and ordering things, and he let devotion to the ideals of this time die out in me. He forced me down to the last and simplest things. The spirit of the deafs took my understanding and all my knowledge and placed them at the service of the inexplicable and the paradoxical. He robbed me of speech and writing for everything that was not in his service, namely the melting together of sense and nonsense, which produces the supreme meaning. But the supreme meaning is the path, the way and the bridge to what is to come. That is the God yet to come. It is not the coming God himself, but his image which appears in the supreme meaning. God is an image, and those who worship him must worship him in the image of the supreme meaning. The supreme meaning is not a meaning and not an absurdity. It is image and force in one, magnificence and force together. The supreme meaning is the beginning and the end. It is a bridge of going across and fulfillment. The other gods died for the temporal temporality. Yet the supreme meaning Yet the supreme meaning never dies. It turns into meaning and then into absurdity. And out of the fire and the blood of the collision, the supreme meaning rises up rejuvenated anew. The image of God has a shadow. The supreme meaning is real and casts a shadow for what can be actual and cor corporeal and have no shadow. The shadow is nonsense. It lacks force and has no continued existence through itself. But nonsense is the inseparable and undying brother of the supreme meaning. Like plants, so men also grow, some in the light, others in the shadows. There are many who need the shadows and not the light. The image of God, of God throws a shadow that is just as great as itself. The supreme meaning is the supreme meaning is great and small. It has it is as wide as the space of the starry heaven, starry heaven, and as narrow as the cell of the living body. The spirit of this time in me wanted to recognize the greatness and extent of the supreme meaning, but not its littleness. The spirit of the death, however, conquered this arrogance. And I had to swallow the small as a means of healing the immortal in me. It completely burnt up in my innards since it was inglorious and unheroic. It was even ridiculous and revolting. But the pliers of the spirit of the death held me. And I had to drink the bitterest of all droughts. The spirit of this time tempted me with the thought that all this belongs to the shadows shadowiness of the God image. This would be pernicious deception, since the shadow is nonsense, but the small, narrow, and banal is not nonsense, but one bo of both of the essences of the Godhead. I resisted, recognizing that the everyday belongs to the image of the Godhead. 
I fled this thought. I hid myself behind the highest and coldest stars. But the spirit of the deafs caught up with me and forced the bitter drink between my lips. The spirit of this time whispered to me, this supreme meaning, this image of God, this melting together of the hot and cold, that is you and only you, but the spirit of death spoke to me. You are an image of the unending world. All the last mysteries of becoming and passing away live in you. If you did not possess all this, how could you know? For the sake of my human weakness, the spirit of the death gave me this word. Yet this word is also superflu superfluous. Since I do not speak it freely, but I, but because I must, I speak because the spirit robs me of joy and life. If I do not speak, I am the serf who brings it and does not know what he carries in his hand. It would burn his hands if he did not place it where his master orders him to lay it. The spirit of our time spoke to me and said, What dire urgency could, you, could be forcing you to speak all this? This was an awful temptation. I wanted, I wanted to ponder what inner or outer blind bind could force me into this. And because I found nothing I could grasp, I was near to making one up. But with this, the spirit of, the of our time had almost brought it about the, that instead of speaking. I was thinking again about reasons and explanations, but the spirit of the deaf spoke to me and said to understand a thing is a bridge and possibility of returning to the path. But to explain a matter is arbitrary and sometimes even murder. Have you counted the murderers among the scholars? But the spirit of this time stepped up to me and laid before me huge volumes which contained all my knowledge. Their pages were made of ore, and a steel stylus had engraved in inexorable words in them. And he pointed to these inexorable words and spoke to me and said, what you speak, that is madness. It is true. It is true what I speak is a greatness and intoxication and ugliness of madness. But the spirit of the death stepped up to me and said, what you speak is, the greatness is, the intoxication is, the undignified sick, paltry dailiness is. It runs in all the streets lives in all the houses, and rules the day of all humanity. Even the eternal stars are commonplace. It is a great mistress and the one essence of God. One laughs about it, and laughter too is. Do you believe, man of this time, that laughter is lower than worship? Where is your measure? False measure. The sum of life decides in laughter and in worship, not your judgment. I must also speak the ridiculousness. The ridiculous, you coming men, you will recognize the supreme meaning by the fact that he is laughter and worship. A bloody laughter and a bloody worship. A sacrificial blood binds the poles, though who know this laugh and worship in the same breath. In breath. In breath. After this, however, my humanity approached me and said, What solitude and what coldness of desolation? You lay upon me when you speak such. Reflect on, on the destruction of being and the streams of blood from the terrible sacrifice that the deaths demand. But the spirit of the deaf said, No one can or shall or should halt sacrifice. Sacrifice is not destruction. Sacrifice is the foundation stone of what is to come. Have you, had, have you not had monasteries? Have not countless thousands gone into the desert? You should carry the monastery in yourself. The desert is within you. The desert calls you and draws you back. And if you were fettered to the world of this time with iron, the call of the desert would break all chains. Truly I prepare you for solitude. After this, my humanity remained silent. Something happened to my spirit. However, which I must call mercy. My speech is imperfect, not because I want to shine with words, but out of the impossibility of finding those words. I speak in images with nothing else can I express the words from the deaths. The mercy which had, which happened to, to me gave me belief, hope, and sufficient daring not to resist further the spirits of the deaths 
of the deafs, but to utter his word. But before I could pull myself together to really do it, I needed a visible sign that would show me that the spirit of the deafs in me was at the same time the ruler of the deaths of world affairs. It happened in October of the year 1913, as I was leaving alone for a journey, that during the day I was suddenly overcome in broad daylight by a vision. I saw a terrible flood that covered all the northern and low-lying lands between the North Sea and the Alps. It reached from England up to Russia and from the coast of the North Sea right up to the Alps. I saw a yellow wave swimming rubble and the death of the countless thousands. So this is Jung's World War II vision. This vision lasted for two hours. It confused me and me and made me ill. I was not able to interpret it. Two weeks passed, then the vision returned, still more violent than before, and an inner voice spoke. Look at it. It is completely real and will come to pass. You cannot doubt this. I rustled again for two hours with this vision, but it held me fast. It left me exhausted and confused, and I thought my mind had gone crazy. From then on, the anxiety toward the terrible event that stood directly before us kept coming back. Once, I also saw a sea of blood over the northern lands. In the, ne in the year 1914, in the month of June, at the beginning and the end of the month, and at the beginning of July, I had the same dream three times. I was in a foreign land, and suddenly overnight, and right in the middle of summer, a terrible cold descended from space. All seas and rivers were locked in ice. Every green living thing had frozen. The second dream was thoroughly similar to this, but the third dream at the beginning of July went as follows. I was in a remote English land, and it was not necessary that I return to my homeland with a fast ship as speedily as possible. I reached home quickly. In my homeland, I found that in the middle of summer, a terrible cold had fallen from space, which had turned every living thing into ice. There stood a leaf-bearing but fruitless tree, whose leaves had turned into sweet grapes full of healing juice through the working of the frost. I picked some grapes and gave them to a great waiting throng. In reality, now it was so, at the time when the Great War broke out between the people of Europe, I found myself in Scotland, compelled by the war to choose the fastest ship and the shortest route home. I encountered the colossal cold that froze everything. I met up with the flood at the Sea of, the, of Blood and found my barren tree, whose leaves of frost had transformed into a remedy, and I plucked the ripe fruit and gave it to you, and I do not know what I poured out for you, what bittersweet intoxicating drink, which left on your tongues an aftertaste of blood. Believe me, it is no teaching and no instruction that I give you. On what basis should I presume to teach you? I give you news of the way of this man, but not of your own way. My path is not your path, therefore I cannot teach you. The way is within us, but not in God's, nor in teaching, nor in laws. Within us is the way, the truth, and the life. Woe betide those who live by the way of examples. Life is not with them. If you live according to an example, you thus live the life of that example. But who should live your own life, if not yourself? So live yourselves. The signposts have fallen. Unblazed tra trails lay before us. Do not be greedy to gobble up the fruits of foreign lands, fields. Do you not know that you yourselves are the fertile acre which bears everything that avails you? Yet who today knows this? Who knows the way to the eternally fruitful climbs of the soul? You seek the way through mere appearance. You study books and give ear to all kinds of opinions. What good is all that? There is only one way that is your way. You seek the path. I warn you away from my own. It can also be the wrong way for you. May each go his own way. I will be no savior, no lawgiver, no master. Teacher unto you, you are no longer little children. Giving laws, bettering, making things easier has all become wrong and evil. May each one seek out his own way. If the way leads to a mutual love in community, men will come to see and feel the similarity and commonality of their ways. Laws and teachings held in common compel people to solitude. 
so that they may escape the pressure of undesirable contact. But solitude makes people hostile and venomous. Therefore, give people digni dignity and let each of them stand apart so that each may find his own fellow fellowship and love it. Power stands against power, contempt against contempt, love against love. Give humanity dignity and trust that life will find the better way. The one eye of the Godhead is blind. The one ear of the Godhead is deaf. The order of its being is crossed by chaos. So be patient with the crippledness of the world and do not overvalue its consummate, consummate beauty. So that's the end of the first passage, the way of what is to come. Um, pretty much Young is talking about your first encounter with the self. There's some sort of greater personality that one comes into contact with. And um, it once you, if you've ever had this experience or know what I'm talking about, um, either way, this commentary will be useful to you because you might listen to this lecture and then have your own experience with this greater self and know what I'm talking about. It will pretty much send you into a state like the desert. You will have no choice but to remain in solitude and confront your inner psyche. Um, you have to let go of your friends and and everything that you desire to pretty much figure out what's going on within yourself. And um, so Jung, this passage is pretty much Jung's introduction to his own solitude and his own psyche. And pretty much um, uh, that's a stage that I've been through. I'm still probably going through it, and I don't know what's going to come next. But... Um, uh, it's pretty much like uh, once you encounter the self, it wounds your ego and you have to contemplate um, um, your your own existence, um, essentially. Um, so pretty much you might find um, that uh, you become almost like a slave to some type of higher um, calling, right? You don't know exactly why you're doing the things you're doing, but you're just doing them because that is what your soul demands of you. And that's where the quote, um, those who have access to the fountain do not drink from the water jar. Um, you pretty much have to stop um, being a sheep and um, doing what everyone else says and, you know, trying to find your own path through, you know, maybe self-help books or even, even university um, you pretty much have to dive within yourself and um, drink the water of the fountain. And then there, meaning will be found, and essentially you will die and be reborn of, into this greater self. And it's a long process. Difficult, um, so because people, people tend not to endure this process because it is too painful for them, or... Um, they're not conscious of not enough of their own habits, and um, but uh, that's why I wanted to read the Red Book because um, it helps you. Um, it gives you a like in the introduction I read some sort of pathway to individuation. So in the next um, passage is called "Redefining the Soul." Now we'll begin. <clears throat> when I had the vision of the flood in October of the year 1913, it happened at a time that was significant for me as a man. At that time in the four, 40th year of my life, I had achieved everything that I had wished for myself. I had achieved honor, power, wealth, knowledge, and every human happiness. Then my desire for the increase of these trappings ceased. Des desire ebbed from me and horror came over me. The vision of the flood seized me, and I fell, felt the spirit of the deaths. But I did not understand him, yet he drove me on with unbearable inner longing. And I said, My soul, where are you? Do you hear me? 
I speak, I call you. Are you there? I have returned. I am here again. I have shaken the dust of all the lands from my feet, and I have come to you. I am with you. After long years of long wanderings, I have come to you again. Should I tell you everything I have seen, experienced, and drunken? Or do you want, or do you not want to hear about all the noise of life and the world? But one thing you must know, the only thing I have learned, is that one must live this life. This life is the way, the long sought after way to the unfathom- unfathomable, which we call divine. There is no other way. Oh, shit. Sorry, I try and keep it. Um, I don't want to be swearing in my episodes just because of YouTube's rules and regulations. I'll cut that out. So there is no other way. All the there's no other way. All other ways are false paths. I found I found the right way. It led me to you, to my soul. I returned, tempered and purified. Do you still know me? How long the separation lasted? Everything has become so different. And how do I find you? How strange my journey was. What word should I use to tell you? You, on what twisted paths a good star has guided me to you. Give me your hand, my almost forgotten soul. How warm the joy at seeing you again, you long disavowed soul. soul. Life has led me back to you. Let us thank the life I have lived for all the happy and all the sad hours. For every joy, for every sadness, my soul. My journey should continue with you. I will wander with you and ascend to my solitude. The spirit of the deaths forced me to say this and at the same time to undergo it again against myself. Since I had not expected it then, I still labored misguidedly under the spirit of this time and thought differently about the human soul. I thought and spoke much of the soul I knew many learned. Words of her. I had judged her and turned into turned her into a scientific object. I did not consider my soul I did not consider that my soul cannot be the object of my judgment and knowledge, much more are my judgment and knowledge the objects of my soul. Therefore, the spirit of the deaths forced me to speak to my soul, to call upon her her as a living self-existing being. I had to become aware that I had lost my soul. From this we learn how the spirit of the deaths considers the soul. He sees her as a living and self-existing being, and with this he contradicts the spirit of this time, for whom the soul is a thing dependent on man, which lets herself be judged and arranged, and whose circum- circumference we can grasp. I had to accept that what I had previously called my soul was not at all my soul, but a dead system. Hence I had to speak to my soul as to something far off and unknown, which did not exist through me but through through whom I existed. You know, reading the Red Book is pretty intense, so forgive me if I take some pauses to center myself. All right. He who desires turns away from outer things, reaches the place of the soul. If he does not find the soul, the horror of emptiness will overcome him and will drive him with a whip, lashing time and time again, in desperate endeavor and a blind desire for the hollow things of the world. He becomes a fool through his endless desire and forgets the way of his soul never to find her again. He will run after all things and will seize hold of them. But he will not find his soul, since he would find her only in himself. Truly his soul lies in things and men. But the blind one sees his things and men, yet not his soul in things and men. He has no knowledge of his soul. How could he tell her apart from things and men? He could find his soul in desire itself, but not in the objects of desire. If he possessed his desire, and his desire did not possess him, he would lay a hand on his soul, since he de- his desire is the image and expression of his soul. 
If we possess the image of a thing, we possess half the thing. The image of the world is half the world. He who possesses the world but not its image possesses only half the world, since his soul is poor and has nothing. The wealth of the soul exists in images. He who possesses the image of the world possesses half the world, even if his humanity is poor and owns nothing. But hunger makes the soul into a beast that devours the unbearable and is poisoned by it. My friends, it is wise to nourish the soul. Otherwise, you will breed dragons and devils in your heart. All right. So that's the end of that passage. And right, we're talking about going into solitude and trying to find your soul, not in men and in other men and things, but in yourself. All right. So the next passage is called Soul and God. On the second night, I called out to my soul. I am weary, my soul. My wandering has lasted too long. My search for myself outside of myself. Now I have gone through events and find you behind all of them. For I made discoveries on my airing through events, humanity, and the world. I found men, and you, my soul, I found again. First in images within men, and then you yourself. I found you where I least expected you. You climbed out of a dark shaft. You announced yourself to me in advance. You announced yourself to me in advance in dreams. They've burned my, in my heart and drove me to all the boldest acts of daring and forced me to rise above myself. You let me see truths of which I had no previous inkling. You let me undertake journeys whose endless length would have scared me if the knowledge of them had not been secure in you. I wandered for many years, so long that I forgot that I possessed a soul. Where were you all this time, which beyond sheltered you and gave you sanctuary? Oh, that you must speak through me, that my speech and I are your symbol and expression. How should I decipher you? <laughs> Bless me. Forgive me. Oh, sorry. Who are you, child? My dreams have represented you as a child and as a maiden. I am ignorant of your mystery. Forgive me if I speak as in a dream like a drunkard. Are you God? Is God a child, a maiden? Forgive me if I babble. No one else hears me. I speak to you quietly, and you know that I am neither a drunkard nor someone deranged, and that my heart twists in pain from the wound, whose darkness delivers speeches full of mo mockery. You are lying to yourself. You spoke so as to deceive others and make them believe in you. You want to be a prophet and chase after your ambition. The wound still bleeds, and I am far from being able to pretend that I do not hear the mockery. How strange it sounds to call me. How strange it sounds to me to call you a child, you who still hold the all will thought end in your hand. Who still hold the all without end in your hand. I went on the way of the day, and you went invisibly, invisibly with me, putting the pieces together meaningfully and letting me see the whole in each part. You took away where I thought to take hold, and you gave me where I did not expect anything in time in time and again you brought about faith from new and unexpected quarters. Where I sowed, you robbed me of the harvest, and where I did not sow, you gave me a fruit of a hundredfold, and time and again I lost a path and found it again, where I would never have foreseen it. You upheld my belief when I was alone and near despair. At every decisive moment, you let me believe in myself. Like a tired wanderer who had sought nothing in the world apart from her, shall I come closer to my soul? I shall not. I shall learn that my soul finally lies behind everything. And if I cross the world, I am ultimately doing this to find my soul. Even the dearest are, are themselves not the goal, an end of that, an end of the love that goes on seeking. They are symbols of their own souls. My friends, do you guess to what solitude we ascend? I must learn that the dregs of my thoughts, my dreams, are the speech of my soul. 
I must carry them in my heart and go back and forth over them. In my mind, like the words of the person dearest to me, dreams are the guiding words of the soul. Why should I henceforth not love my dreams and not make their riddling images into objects of my daily consideration? You think that the dream is foolish and ungainly. What is beautiful? What is ungainly? What is clever? What is foolish? The spirit of this time is your measure, but the spirit of the deaths surpasses it as at both ends. Only the spirit of this time knows the difference between large and small, but this difference is invalid, like the spirit which recognizes it. The spirit of, a de of the deaths even taught me to consider my action and my decision as dependent on dreams. Dreams pave the way for life and they determine you without you, under without you understanding their language. One would like to learn this language, but who can teach and learn it? Scar scholarliness is scar sorry scholarliness alone is not enough there is a knowledge of the heart that gives deeper insight the knowledge of the heart is no book and is not to be found in the mouth of any teacher but grows out of you like the green seed from the dark earth scar scholarliness belongs to the spirit of this time but this spirit is in no way it grasps the dream since the soul is everywhere that scholarly knowledge is not. But how can I attain the knowledge of the heart? You can attain this knowledge only by living a life to the full. You live your, your life fully if you also live what you have never yet lived, but have left for others to live or think. You will say, but I cannot live or think everything that others live or think. But you should say, the life that I could still live, I should live in the thought, and the thoughts that I could still think I should think. It appears as though you want to flee from yourself, so as not to have to live what remains unlived until now. But you cannot flee from yourself. It is with you all the time and demands fulfillment. If you pretend to be blind and dumb to this demand, you feign being blind and deaf to yourself. This way you will never reach the knowledge of the heart. The knowledge of the heart is how your heart is. From a cunning heart, you will know cunning. From a good heart, you will know the goodness. So that your understanding becomes perfect. Consider that your heart is both good and evil. You ask, what, should I also live evil? The spirit of, of the deaths demands the life that you could still live, you should live. Well-being decides, not your well-being, not the well-being. Sorry. Well-being decides not your well-being, not the well-being of the others, but only well-being. Well-being is between me and others in society. I, too, lived, which I had not done before, and which, and which I could still do. I lived into the deaths, and the deaths became, began to speak. The deaths taught me the other truth. It thus united sense and nonsense in me. I had to recognize that I am only the expression and soul and symbol of the soul. In the sense of the spirit of the deaths, I am, as I am in this invisible world, a symbol of my soul, and I am thoroughly serf, completely subjugated, utterly obedient. The spirit of the deaths taught me to say, I am the servant of a child. Through this dictum, I learn above all the most extreme humility as what I most need. The spirit of this time, of course, allowed me to believe in my reason. He let me see myself in the image of a leader with ripe thoughts. But it's the spirit of the deaths teaches me that I am a servant. In fact, the servant of a child. This dictum was repugnant, repug repugnant to me, and I hated it. But I had to recognize and accept that my soul is a child, and that my God in my soul is a child. If you are boys, your God is a woman. If you are a woman, your God is a boy. If you are men, your God is a maiden. The God is where you are not. So, it is wise that one has a God. This serves for your perfection. A maiden is the pregnant future. A boy is the engendering future. A woman is having given birth. 
man is having engendered. So if you are childlike beings now, your God will descend from the height of ripeness to age and death. But if you are developed beings having engendered or given birth in body or in soul, so your God rises from the radiant cradle to the incalculable height of the future, to the maturity and fullness of the coming time. He who still has this life before him is a child. He who lives life in the present is developed. If thus live all that you can live, you are developed. He who is a child in this time, his God dies. He who is developed in this time, his God continues to live. The spirit of the deaf teaches this mystery. Prosperous and woeful are those whose God is developed. Prosperous and woeful are those whose God is a child. What is better, that man has life ahead of him or that God does? I know no answer. Live the unavoidable decides. The spirit of the deaf taught me that my life is encompassed by the divine child. From his hand everything unexpected came to me, everything living. This child is what I feel as an eternally springing youth in me. In childish men you feel that the hopeless transience, all that you saw passing is yet to come for him. His future is joyful, full of transience. But the transience of the things coming towards you has never yet experienced a human meaning. Your continuing to live is a living onward. You engender and give birth to what is to come. You are fecund. You live onward. The childish, the childish is unfruitful. What is to come to him is what has already been engendered and already withered. It does not live onward. My God is a child, so wonder not that the spirit of this time in me is incensed to mockery and scorn. There will be no one who will laugh at me as I laughed at myself. Your God should not be a man of mockery. Rather, you yourself will be the man of mockery. You should mock yourself and rise above this. If you have still not learned this from the old holy books, then go there, drink the blood, and eat the flesh of him who has mocked, tormented for the sake of our sins, so that, so that you totally become his nature, deny his being apart from you. You should be he himself, not Christians, but Christ. You will be of no use to the coming God. Is there any one among you who believes he can be spared the way? Can he swindle his way past the pain of Christ? I say, such a one deceives himself to his own de detriment. He beds down on thorns and fire. No one can be spared the way of Christ since this way leads to what is to come. You should all become Christ. You do not overcome the old teachings through doing less, but through doing more. Every step closer to my soul excites the scornful laughter of my devils, those cowardly ear whisperers and poison makers. It was easy for them to laugh since I had to dis since I had to sh since I had to strange things. All right, so that's the end of that passage. I just want to um, bring up. Um, how this relates maybe to the hero's journey. Um, so there comes a time where you have to go into the belly of the whale to rescue your father. So what Young is essentially saying is if you do not, um, let's see here. That, uh, so you do not overcome the old teachings through doing less, but through doing more. Every step close to my soul excites the scornful laughter of my devils. And you should mock yourself and rise above this if you have still not learned this from the, the old holy books. Then go there, drink the blood, and eat the flesh of him who was, who was mocked. Right, so this is going back and um, essentially... Um, um, Suffering just as Christ did, trying to um, reconnect to the soul. So the next uh, passage is called On the Service of the Soul. And uh, I'll begin that in a bit. All right. 
on the service of the soul. On the following night, I had to write down all the dreams that I could re re recollect. True to their wording, the meaning of this act was dark to me. Why all this? Forgive the fuss that rises in me, yet you want me to do this. What strange things are happening to me? I know too much not to see on what swaying bridges I go. Where are you leading me? Forgive my excessive app apprehension. Brimful of knowledge, my foot hesitates to follow you. Into what mist and darkness does your path lead? Must I also learn to do without meaning? If this is what you demand, then so be it. This hour belongs to you. What is there where there is no meaning? Only nonsense or madness, it seems to me. Is there also a supreme meaning? Is that your meaning, my soul? I limp after you on crutches. <coughs> I limp after you on crutches of understanding. I am a man, and you stride like a god. What torture. I must return to myself, to my smallest things. I saw the things of my soul as a small, pitiable, pitiably small. You force me to see them as large, to make them large. Is that your aim? I follow, but it terrifies me. Hear my doubts, otherwise I cannot follow, since your meaning is a supreme meaning. And your steps are the steps of a god. I understand I must not think either, should I should thought too no longer be. I should give myself completely into your hands. But who are you? I do not trust you. Not once to trust is that my love for you, my joy in you. Do I not trust ever valiant, every valiant man? And not you, my soul. Your hands lie heavy on me. But I will, I will. Have I not sought to love men and trust them? And should I not this do this with you? Forget my doubts. I know it is ignorable to doubt you. Ignoble to doubt you. You know how difficult it is for me to set aside the beggar's pride. I take in my own thought. I forgot that you are also one of my friends. And have the first right to my trust. Should what I give them not belong to you? I recognize my injustice. It seems to me that I despised you. My joy at finding you again was not genuine. I also recognize that the scornful laughter in me was right. I must learn to love you. Should I also set aside self-judgment? I am afraid. Then the soul spoke to me and said, This fear testifies against me. It is true it testifies against you. It kills the holy trust between you and me. How hard is fate? If you take a step toward your soul, you will at first miss the meaning. You will believe that you have sunk into meaninglessness, into eternal disorder. You will be right. Nothing will deliver you from disorder and meaninglessness since there is the other half of the world, since this is the other half of the world. Your God is a child. So long as you are not childlike, is a child order meaning or a disorder? Caprice. Disorder and meaninglessness are the mother of order and meaning. Order and meaning are things that have become and are no longer becoming. You open the gates of the soul to let the dark floods of chaos flow into your order and meaning. If you marry the order to the chaos, you produce the divine child, the supreme meaning beyond meaning and meaninglessness. You are afraid to open the door. I too was afraid, since we had forgotten that God is terrible. Christ taught God is love. But you should know that love is also terrible. I spoke to a loving soul and as I drew nearer to her, I was overcome by a horror. And I he heaped up a wall of doubt and I did not anticipate that I thus wanted to protect myself from my fearful soul. You dread the deaths. It should horrify you since the way of what is to come leads through it. You must endure the temptation of fear and doubt and at the same time acknowledge to the bone that your fear is justified and your doubt is reasonable. How otherwise could it be a true temptation and true overcoming? Christ totally overcomes the temptation of the devil, but not the temptation of God to good and reason. Christ thus succumbs to cursing. You still have to learn this, to succumb to no temptation, but to do everything of your own will, then you will be free and beyond Christianity. I have had to recognize that I must submit to what I fear, yes, even more that I must even love what horrifies me. We must learn such from that saint who was disgusted by the plague, infect, 
infections. She drank the pus of plague bowls and became, became aware that it smelled like roses. The acts of the saints were not in vain. In everything regarding your salvation and the attainment of mercy, you, you are dependent on your soul. Thus no sacrifice can be too great for you. If your virtuous hinder you from salvation, discard them. Since they have become evil to you, the slave to virtue finds the way as little as the slave to vices. If you believe that you are the master of your soul, then become her servant. If you were her servant, make yourself her master, since she needs to be ruled. These should be your first steps. During six for the nights, the spirit of death was silent to me, in me. Since I had swayed between fear, defiance, and nausea, and was wholly the prey of my passion, I could not and did not want to listen to the deafs. But on the seventh night, the spirit of the deafs spoke to me. Look into your deafs, pray to your deafs, waken the dead. But I stood helpless and did not know what I could do. I looked into myself, and the only thing I found within was the memory of earlier dreams all of which I wrote down without knowing what good this would do. I wanted to throw everything away and return to the light of day, but the spirit stopped me and forced me back into myself. Alright. So the next passage is called The Desert. Sixth night, my soul leads me into the desert, into the, de into the desert of my own self. I did not think that my soul is a desert, a barren, hot, desert, dusty, and without drink. The journey leads through hot sand, slowly waiting without a visible goal to hope for. How eerie is this wasteland? It seems to me that the way leads so far away from mankind. I take my way step by step and do not know how long my journey will last. Why is myself a desert? Have I lived too much outside of myself in men and events? Why did I avoid myself? Was I not dear to myself? But I have avoided this the place of my soul. I was my thoughts. After I was no longer events and other men, but I was not myself confronted, confronted with my thoughts. I should also rise above my thoughts to my own self. My journey goes there, and that is why it leads away from men and events into solitude. Is it solitude to be with oneself? Solitude is truly only when the self is a desert. Should I also make a garden out of the desert? Should I, should I people it, a des, should I people a desolate plate land? Should I open the airy magic garden of the wilderness? What leads me into the desert, and what I am, what am I to do there? Is it a deception that I can no longer trust my thoughts? Only life is true, and only life leads me into the desert. Truly, not my thinking that would like to return to thoughts to men and events. Since it feels uncanny in the desert, my soul, what am I to do here? But my soul spoke to me and said, wait. I heard the cruel world word, torment belongs to the desert. I also had to detach myself from my thoughts through turning my desire away from them. And at once I noticed that myself became a desert where only the sun of unique, unquiet desire burned. I was overwhelmed by the endless infertility of this desert. Even if something could have thrived there, the creative desire was still absent. Wherever the creative, creative power of desire is, there springs the soul's own seed. But do not forget to wait. Did you not see that when, you, when your creative force turned to the world, how the dead things moved under it and through it, how they grew and prospered, and how your thoughts flowed in rich rivers? If your creative force now turns to the place of the soul, you will see how your soul becomes green and how its field field bears wonderful fruit. Through giving my soul all I could give, I came to that place of the soul and found that this place was a hot desert, desolate and unfruitful. No culture of the mind is enough to make a garden out of your soul. I had cultivated my spirit, the spirit of this time in me, but not the spirit of the depths that turns to the things of the soul, the world of the soul. The soul has its own peculiar world, only the self enters in there, where the man who has completely become his self, he who is neither in events nor in men, nor in his thoughts. Through the turning of my desire from things and men, 
I turned myself away from things and men, but that is precisely how I became the secure prey of my thoughts. Yes, I wally became my thoughts. Nobody can spare themselves the waiting and most nobody can spare themselves the waiting and most will be unable to bear this torment, but will throw themselves with greed back to men, things and thoughts, whose slaves they will become from then on. Since then it will have been clearly proved that this is this man is incapable of enduring beyond things, men and thoughts, and they will hence become his master, and his, he will become their fool, since he cannot be without them, not even if, not until even his soul has become a fruitful field. Also, he whose soul is a garden needs things, men, and thoughts, that he is their friend and not their slave and fool. Everything to come was already in images. To find their soul, the ancients went into the desert. This is an image. The ancients lived their symbols since the world had not yet become real for them. Thus they went into the solitude of the desert to teach us that the place of the soul is a lonely desert. There they found the abundance of visions, the fruits of the desert, the wondrous flowers of the soul. Think diligently about the images that the ancients have left behind. They show the way of what is to come. Look, up, look back at the collapse of empires, of growth and death, of the desert and monasteries. They are the images of what is to come. Everything has been foretold. But who knows how to interpret it? When you say that the place of a soul is not, then it is not. But if you say that it is, then it is. Notice, notice that. Notice what the ancients said in images. The word is a creative act. The ancients said, "In the beginning was the word." Consider this and think upon it. The words that oscillate between nonsense and supreme meaning are the oldest and truest. All right, it's getting really good. Experiences in the desert. After a hard struggle, I have come a piece of the way nearer to you. How hard the struggle was. I had follow, fallen into an undergrowth of doubt, confusion, and scorn. I recognize that I must be alone with my soul. I come with empty hands to you, my soul. What do you want to hear? But my soul spoke to me and said, If you come to a friend, do you come to take? I knew that this should not be so, but it seems to me that I am poor and empty. I would like to sit down near you and at least feel the breath of your animating presence. My way is hot sand, all day long sandy, dusty paths. My patience is sometimes weak, and I once despaired of myself, as you know. My soul answered and said, You speak to me as if you were a child, complaining to its mother. I am not your mother. I do not want to complain. But let me say to you that mine is a long and dusty road. You are to me like a shady tree in the wilderness. I would like to enjoy your shade, but my soul answered, You are pleasure-seeking. Where is your patience? Your time has not yet run its course. Have you forgotten why you went into the, de into the desert? My faith is weak. My, faith, my face is blind. From all that shimmering blaze of the desert sun, the heat lies on me like lead. Thirst torments me. I do not think how unendingly long my way is, and above all, I see nothing in front of me. But the soul answered, You speak as if you have still learned nothing. Can you not wait? Should everything fall into your lap, ripe and finished? You are full. Yes, you teem with intentions and desireness. Do you still not know what the Do you still not know that the way to truth stands openly? open only to those without intentions. I know that everything you say, O oh, my soul, is also my thought, but I hardly live according to it. The soul said, How? Tell me, do you then believe that your thoughts should help you? I would always like to refer to the fact that I am a human being, just as a human being was weak. <laughs> Bless me. I end off. I would also like to refer to the fact that I am a human being, just as a human being who is weak and sometimes does not do his best. But the soul said, "Is that what you think it means to be human? You are hard, my soul, but you are right. How little we still commit ourselves to living. We should grow like a tree, like 
that likewise does not know its law. We tie ourselves up with intentions, not mindful of the fact that intention is the limitation, yes, the exclusion of life. We believe that we can illuminate the darkness with an intention, and in that way ain't past the light. How, we, how can we presume to know, to want to know in advance from where the light will come to us? Let me bring only one complaint before you. I suffer from scorn, my own scorn, but my soul said to me, Do you think little of yourself? I do not believe so. My soul answered, Then listen, do you think little of me? Do you still not know what you do you still not know that you are not writing a book to feed your vanity, but that you are speaking with me? How can you suffer from scorn if you address me with those words that I give you? Do you know then who I am? Have you grasped me, defined me, and made me into a dead formula? Have you measured the depths of my chasm, chasms, C-H-A-S-M-S, and explored all the ways down which I am yet going to lead you? Scorn cannot challenge you if you are not vain to the marrow of your bones. Your truth is hard. I want to lay down my vanity before you, since it blinds me. See, that is why I also believe my hands were empty when I came to you today. I did not consider that it is you who fills empty hands, if only they want to stretch out, yet they, they do not want to. I did not know that I am your vessel, empty without you, but brimming, brimming over with you. This was my 12th, 25th night in the desert. This is how long it, it took my soul to awaken from a shadowy being to her own life. Until she could approach me as a freestanding being separate from me. And I received hard but solitary, solitary words from her. I needed that taking in hand since I could not overcome the scorn within me. The spirit of this time considers itself extremely clever. Like every such spirit of the time... But the wisdom is simple-minded, not just simple. Because of this, the clever person mocks wisdom, since mockery is his weapon. He uses the poison, pointed poisonous weapon because he is struck by naive wisdom. If he were not struck, he would not need the weapon. Only in the desert do we become aware of our ter terrible simple-mindedness, but we are afraid of admitting it. That is why we are scornful, scornful. But mockery does not attain simple-mindedness. The mockery falls on the mocker. And in the desert, where no one hears and answers, he suffocates from his own scorn. The cleverer you are, the more foolish your simple-mindedness. The, the totally clever are total fools in this simple-mindedness. We cannot save ourselves from the cleverness of the spirit of this time through increasing our cleverness. But through accepting what our cleverness hates most, namely simple-mindedness. Yet we also do not want to be artificial fools because we have fallen, in, fallen into simple-mindedness. Rather, we will be clever fools that lead to the supreme meaning. Cleverness couples itself with intention. Simple-mindedness knows no intention. Cleverness conquers the world, but simple-mindedness, the soul. So take on the vow of poverty of spirit in order to partake of the soul. Against this, the scorn of my cleverness rose up. Many will laugh at my foolishness, but no one will laugh more than I laughed at myself. So I overcame scorn, but when I had overcome it, I was near to my soul. And she could speak to me, and I was soon to see the desert becoming green. All right, I really like um, uh, how this reading is going. I don't think I need to clarify anything in specific. Um, I already talked about um, the solitude and having to re refine your soul. But I will begin this next pas passage called Descent into Hell in the Future. In the following night, the air was filled with many voices. A loud, a loud voice called, I am falling. Others cried out, confused and excited during this time, during this. 
Where to? What do you want? Should I entrust myself to this confusion? I shuddered. It is a dreadful deep. Do you want me to leave myself to chance, to the mad madness of my own darkness? Whither? Whither? You fall, and I want to fall with you, whoever you are. The spirit of the death op opened my eyes, and I caught a glimpse of the inner things, the world of my soul, the many formed and changing. I see a gray rock face along which I sink into great depths. I stand in black dirt up to my ankles in a dark cave. Shadows sweep over me. I'm seized by fear, but I know I must go in. I crawl through a narrow crack in the rock and reach an inner cave whose bottom is covered with black water. But beyond this I catch a glimpse of a luminous red stone which I must reach. I wade through the muddy water. The cave is full of the frightful noise of shrieking voices. I take the stone. This is probably like the philosopher's stone. I take the stone. It covers a dark opening in the rock. I hold the stone in my hand, ping peering around inquiringly. I do not want to listen to the voices that keep me away. But I want to know. Here, something wants to be uttered. uttered. I place my ear to the opening. I hear the flow of underground waters. I see the bloody head of a man in, on the dark stream. Someone wounded, someone slain floats there. I take in this image for a long time. Shuddering, I see a black scarab floating past on the dark stream. In the deepest reach of the stream shines a red sun, radiating through the dark water. There I see, and a terror seizes me, small serpents on the dark rock walls, striving towards the depths where the sun shines, a thousand serpents crowd around, veiling the sun, deep nights fall, a red stream of blood, thick red blood springs up, surging for a long time, then ebbing, I am seized by fear, what did I see? Sentencio. Heal the wounds that doubt inflicts on me, my soul, that too is to be overcome, so that I can recognize your supreme meaning, how far away everything is and how I have turned back. My spirit is a spirit of torment. It tears asunder my contemplation. It would dismantle everything and rip it apart. I am still a victim of my thinking. When can I order my thinking to be quiet so that my thoughts those unruly hounds will crawl to my feet. How can I ever hope to hear your voice louder, to see your face clearer, when all my thoughts howl? I am stunned, by, a, but I want to be stunned, since I am sworn to you, my soul, to, sh to trust you even if you lead me through madness. How sh shall I ever walk under your sun if I do not drink the bitter drought of slumber to the lees? Help me so that I do not choke on my own knowledge. The fullness of my knowledge threatens to fail, it, to fall in on me. My knowledge has a thousand voices, an army roaring like lions. The air trembles when they speak, and I am their defenseless sacrifice. Keep it far from me, science, that clever knower, that clever knower, that bad prison master who blind, who binds the soul and imprisons it in a lightless cell. But above all, protect me from the serpents of judgment, which only appear to be healing, to be a healing serpent. Yet in your deaths is infernal poison and agonizing death. I want to go down cl cleansed into your deaths with white garments and not rush in like some thief, seizing whatever I can and fleeing breath breathlessly. Let me persist in divine astonishment so that I am ready to behold your wonders let me lay my head on a stone before your door, so that I am prepared to receive your light. When the desert begins to bloom, it brings forth strange plants. You will, you will consider yourself mad, and in a certain sense you will in fact be mad. To the extent that the Christianity of this time lacks madness, it lacks divine life. Take note of what the ancients taught us in images. Madness is divine. But because the ancients lived this image con concretely in events, it became a deception for us. 
since we become masters of the reality of the world. It is unquestionable. If you enter into the world of the soul, you are like a madman, and as and a doctor would consider you to be sick. What I say here can be as sickness, but no one can see it as sickness more than I do. This is how I overcome madness. If you do not know what divine madness is, suspend your judgment and wait for the fruits. But know that there is a divine madness which is nothing other than the overpowering of the spirit of this time through the spirit of the deaths. Speak then of sick delusion. When the spirit of the deaths can no longer stay down and forces a man to speak in tongues instead of in human speech and make him believe that he himself is the spirit of the deaths, but also speak of sick delusion when the spirit of this time does not leave a man and forces him to see only the surface, to deny the spirit of the deaths and to take himself for the spirit of the times. To take himself for the spirit of the times. The spirit of this time is ungodly. The spirit of the deaths is ungodly. Balance is godly. Because I was caught up in the spirit of this time, precisely what happened to me on this night had to happen to me, namely that the spirit of the deaths erupted with force and swept away the spirit of this time with a powerful wave. But the spirit of the deaths had gained this power because I spoke. I had spoken to my soul during 25 nights in the desert and I had given her all my love and submission. But during the 25 days, I gave all my love and submission to things, to men, and to the thoughts of this time. I went into the desert only at night. Thus, you can differentiate sick and divine delusion. Whoever does the, does the one and does without the other, you may call sick, since he is out of balance. But who can withstand fear when the divine intoxicates? Sication and madness comes to him. Love, soul, and God are beautiful and terrible. The ancients brought over some of the beauty of God into this world, and this world became so beautiful that it appeared to the spirit of the time to be fulfillment and better than the bosom of the Godhead. The frightfulness and cruelty of the world lay under wraps and in the depths of our hearts. If the spirit of the deaf seizes you, you will feel cruelty and cry out in torment. The spirit of the deafs. The spirit of the deafs is pregnant with iron, fire, and death. You are right to fear the spirit of the deafs, as he is full of horror. You see, in these days, what the spirit of the deafs bore, you do, you did not believe it, but you would have known if you had taken counsel with your fear. Blood shone at me from red light of the crystal, and when I picked it up to discover its mysteries, where there lay the horror uncovered before me. In the depths of what is to come lay murder, the blonde hero lay slain. The black beetle is the death that is nece necessary for renewal, and so thereafter a new sun glowed, the sun of the deaths, full of riddles, sun of the night. And as the rising sun of springs quickens, the dead earth, so the son of the deaths quickened the dead. And thus began the terrible struggle between light and darkness. And out of that burst a powerful and even unvanquished source of blood. This was that this was what was to come, which you now experience in your life, and it is even more than that. I had this vision on the night of the twelfth of december nineteen thirteen. Depths and surface should mix so that new life can develop, yet the new life does not develop outside of us, but within us. What happens outside us in these days is an image that the peoples live in events. To bequeath this image imm immemorially to far off time so that they might learn from it for their own way. Just as we learn from the images that the ancients had lived before us in events, Life does not come from events, but from us. Everything that happens outside has already been. Therefore, whoever considers the events from outside always see, from outside I, therefore whoever considers the events from outside always sees only that it already was, and that it is always the same. But whoever, but whoever looks from inside knows that everything is new. The events that happen are always the same but the creative deaths of man are not always the same. Events signify nothing. They signify only in us. We create the meaning of events. 
the meaning is and always was artificial. We make it. I believe this is Eros. Because of this, we seek in ourselves the meaning of events so that the way of what is to come becomes apparent and our life can flow again. That which you need comes from yourself, namely, namely the meaning of the event. The meaning of events is not their particular meaning. This meaning exists in learned books. Events have no meaning. The meaning of events is the way of salvation that you create. The meaning of, of events comes from the possibility of life in this world that you create. It is the mastery of this world and the assertion of your soul in this world. This meaning of events is a supreme meaning that is not in events and not in the soul, but is the God standing between events and the soul, the mediator of life, the way, the bridge, and the going across. I would not have been able to see what was to come if I could not have seen it in myself. Therefore, I take part in that murder. The son of the deaths also shines in me after the murder has been accomplished. The thousand serpents that want to devour the sun are also in me. I myself am a murderer and a murdered, sacrificer and sacrificed, the upwelling blood streams out of me. You all have a share in the murder, and you, the, rebor the reborn one, will come to be, and the sun of the, of the deaths will rise, and a thousand serpents will develop from your dead matter and fall on the sun to choke it. Your blood will stream forth the... Sorry, Getting a bit caught up. You all, you all have a share in the murder. And you, the reborn one, will become to be. And the son of the deaths will rise. And a thousand serpents will develop from your dead matter. And fall on the sun to choke it. Your blood will stream forth. The peoples demonstrates this at the present time in unforgettable acts that will be written with blood in unforgettable books for eternal memory. But I ask you, when do men fall on their brothers with mighty weapons and bloody acts? They do such if they do not know what their brother is themselves. They themselves are sacrificers, but they mutually do the service of sacrifice. They must all sacrifice each other, since the time has not yet come when man puts the bloody knife into himself in order to sacrifice the one he kills his own brother. But whom do people kill? They kill the noble, the brave, the heroes. They take aim at these and do not know that with these they mean themselves. They should sacrifice the hero in themselves, and because they do not know this, they kill their courageous brother. The time is still not ripe, but through this blood sacrifice it should ripen. So long as it is possible to murder a brother instead of oneself, the time is not ripe. Frightful things must happen until men grow ripe, but, until, but anything else will not ripen humanity. Hence, all this takes place in these days must also be so that the renewal can come. Since the source of blood that follows the shouting of the sun is also the source of new light, as the fate of the people is represented to you in events, so will it happen in your heart. If the hero is in, in use is slain, then the son of the deaths rises in you, glowing from afar and from a dreadful place. But all the same, everything that up till now seemed to be dead in you will come to life, it will change into poisonous serpents that will cover the sun, and you will fall into night and confusion. Your blood also will stream from many wounds in this frightful struggle. struggle. Your shock and doubt will be great, but from such torment the new life will be born. Birth is blood and torment. Your darkness, which you did not suspect since it was dead, will come to life, and you will feel the crush of total evil and the conflicts of life that still now lie buried in the matter of your body. But the serpents are dreadful evil thoughts and feelings. You thought you knew the, that abyss. Sorry. You thought you knew that abyss. Oh, you clever people. It is another thing to experience it. Everything will happen to you. Think of all the frightful and devilish things that men have inflicted on their brothers. That should happen to you in your heart. Suffer it yourself through your own hand and know that it is your own heinous and devilish hand that inflicts the suffering on you, but not your brother who wrestles with his own devils. I would like you to see what the murdered hero means. Those nameless men who in our day have murdered a prince or a blind prophets who demonstrate in events that 
what then is valid, valid only for the soul. Through the murder of the princes, we will learn that the prince is, is in us. The hero is threatened. Whether this should be seen as a good or bad sign need not concern us. What is awful today is good in a hundred years, and in two hundred years is bad again. But we must recognize what is happening. There are nameless ones in you who threaten your prince, the hered hereditary ruler. But our ruler is the spirit of this time, which rules and leads in us all. It is a general spirit in which we think and act today. He is of frightful power, since he has brought immeasurable good to this world and fascinated men with unbelievable pleasure. He is bejeweled with the most beautiful heroic virtue and wants to drive men to the brightest solar heights and everlasting ascent. The hero wants to open up everything he can, but the nameless spirit of the deaths evokes everything that men cannot. Incapacity prevents further ascent. Greater height requires greater virtue. We do not possess it. We must first create it by learning to live with our incapacity. We must give it life, for how else shall it develop into ability? We cannot slay our inc incapacity and rise above it, but that is precisely what we wanted. Incapacity will be overcome us and demand its share of life. Our ability will desert us and we'll be, we will believe in a sense of the spirit of this time, that it, it is a loss. Yet it is no loss but a gain, not for our outer trappings, however, but for inner capability. The one who learns to live with his incapacity has learned a great deal. This will lead us to the valuation of the smallest things and to wise limitation, which the greater height demands. If all heroism is erased, we fall back into the misery of humanity and into even worse. Our foundation will be caught up in excitement since our highest tension, which concerns what lies outside us, will stir them up. We will fall into the cesspool of our underworld among the rubble of all the centuries in us. The heroic in you is the fact that you are ruled by the thought that this or that is good, that this or that performance is indispensable, this or that cause is objective, objective Sorry. Objectionable. This or that goal must be attained in headlong striving work. This or that pleasure should be ruthless repressed at all costs. Consequently, you, you sin against incapacity. But incapacity exists. No one should deny it, find fault with it, or shout it down. All right. That was a, quite a long passage. But just as significant right the next chapter all right uh, splitting of the spirit but on the fourth night I cried to journey to hell means to become hell oneself it all frighteningly frightfully muddled and interwoven on this desert desert sorry hold on it all frightfully muddled and interwoven. On this desert path, there is not just glowing sand, but also horrible, tangled, invisible beings who live in this desert. I didn't know this. The way is only apparently clear. The desert is only apparently empty. It seems inhabited by magical beings who murderously attach themselves to me and da demonically change my form. I have evidently taken on a completely monstrous form in which I can no longer recognize myself. It seems to me that I have become a monstrous animal form for which I have exchanged my humanity. This way is surrounded by hellish magic. Invisible nooses have been thrown over me and ensnare me. But the spirit of the death approached me and said, Climb down into your depths. Sink. But I was indignant at him and said, how can I sink? I am unable to do this myself. Then the spirit spoke words to me that appeared ridiculous. And he said, sit yourself down, be calm. But I cried out indign indignantly. How frightful it sounds like nonsense. Do you also demand this for me, of me? You overthrow the mighty gods who, who mean the most to us. My soul, where are you? 
Have I entrusted myself to stupid to a stupid animal? Do I stagger like a drunkard to the grave? Do I stammer stupidities like a lunatic? Is this your way, my soul? The blood boils in me, and I would strangle you if I could seize you. You weave the thickest darkness, and I am like a madman caught in your net. But I yearn, teach me, but my spouse my soul spake spoke to me saying, My path is light. Yet I indignantly answered, Do you call light what we men call the worst darkness? Do you call day night? To this my soul spoke a word that roused my anger. My light is not of this world. I cried, I know of no other world. The soul answered, Should it not exist because you know nothing of it? I I referring to young. But our knowledge, does our knowledge also not hold good for you? What is going to be if not knowledge? Where is this, where is security? Where is solid ground? Where is light? Your darkness is not only dark at the night, but bottomless as well. If it's not going to be knowledge, then perhaps it will do without speech and words too. My soul, no words. I. Forgive me, perhaps I'm hard of hearing. Perhaps I misinterpret you. Perhaps I ensnare myself in the self-deceit and monkey business. And I am a rascal grinning at myself in a mirror. A fool in my own mad house. Perhaps you stumble over my folly. My soul. You delude yourself. You do not deceive me. Your words are lies to you, not me. I. But could I wallow in raging nonsense and hatch absurdity and perverse monotony? Maton Monotony. My soul, who gives you thoughts and words? Do you make them? Are you not my serf, a recipient who lies at my door and picks up my alms? And you dare think that what you devise and speak could be nonsense? Don't you know yet that it comes from me and belongs to me? So I cried full of anger. So I cried full of anger. But then my indignation must also come from you. And in me you are indignant against yourself. My soul then spoke the ambiguous words, that is, civil war. I was afflicted with pain and rage, and I answered back, How painful, my soul, to hear you use hollow words. I feel sick, comedy and drivel, but I yearn. I can also crawl through mud in the most despised banality. I can also eat dust, that is part of hell. I do not yield, I am defiant. You can go on dev devising torments, spider-legged monsters, ridiculous, hideous, frightful, theatrical spectacles. Come close, I am ready. Ready, my soul, you who are a devil, to wrestle with you, too. You donned the mask of a god, and I worshipped you. Now you wear the mask of a devil, a frightful one, the mask of the banal, of eternal mediocrity. Only one favor. Give me a moment to step back and consider. Is the struggle with the mask worthwhile? Was the mask of God worth worshipping? I cannot do it. The lust for battle burns in my limbs. Now, limbs. No, I cannot leave the battlefield defeated. I want to seize you, crush you, monkey buffoon. Woe if the struggle is unequal. My hands gra grab at air. But you, you, sorry. But your blows are also air. And I perceive trickery. And I find myself again on the desert path. It was a desert vision. A vision of the solitary who has, who has wandered down long roads. The lurk. There lurk invisible robbers and assassins and shooters of poisonous darts. Suppose the murderous arrow is stickling in my heart. As the first vision had predicted to me, the assassin appeared from the depths and came to me just as in the fate of the peoples of this time. A nameless one appeared and leveled the murder weapon at the prince. I felt myself tra transformed into a rapacious beast. My heart glow glowered in rage against the high and beloved, against my prince and hero. Just as the name less one of the people, driven by greed for murder, lunged at his dear prince. Because I carried the murder in me, I foresaw it. Because I carried the war in me, I foresaw it. I felt betrayed and lied to by my king. Why did I feel this way? He was not as I had wished him to be. He was other, other than I expected. He should be the king in my sense, not in his sense. 
He should be what I called ideal. My soul appeared to my to me hollow, tasteless, and meaningless. But in reality, what I thought of her was valid for my ideal. It was a vision of the desert. I struggled with mere images of myself. It was civil war in me. I myself was the murderer and the murdered. The deadly arrow was struck in my heart, stuck in my heart, and I did not know what it meant. My thoughts were murder and fear of death, which spread like poison everywhere in my body. And thus was the fate of the people. The murder of one was the poisonous arrow that flew into the hearts of men and kindled the fiercest war. This murder is the indignation of incapacity against will, a Judas betrayal that one would like someone else to have committed. We are still seeking the goat that should bear our sin. So he's talking about the start of World War I. Everything that becomes too old becomes evil. The same is true of your highest. Learn from the suffering of the crucified God that one can also betray and crucify a God, namely, namely the God of the old year. If a God sees as being the way of life, he must fall secretly. The God became sick. If he oversteps to the heights of the zenith, that is why the spirit of the death took me when the spirit of this time had led me to the summit. All right, I'll stop there. All right. Murder of the hero. On the following night, however, I had a vision. I was with, I was with a youth in high mountains. It was before daybreak. The eastern sky was already light. Then Siegfried's horn resounded over the mountains with a jubilant sound. We knew that our mortal enemy was coming. We were armed and lurked beside a narrow rocky path to murder him. Then we saw him coming high across the mountains on a chariot made of the bones of the dead. He drove boldly and magnificently over the steep rocks and arrived at the narrow path where we waited in hiding. As he came around the turn ahead of us, we fired at the same time and he fell slain. Thereupon, thereupon I turned to flee and a terrible rain swept down. But after this, I went through a torment unto death and I felt certain that I must kill myself if I could not solve the riddle of the murder of the hero. Then the spirit of the death came to me and spoke these words. The highest truth is one and the same with the absurd. This statement saved me, and like rain after a long hot spell, it swept away everything in me which was too highly tensed. Then I had a second vision. I saw a merry garden in which forms walked clawed, clad in white silk, all co covered in colored light. Some reddish, the others bluish and greenish. I know I have stridden across the depths through guilt. I have become a newborn. We also live in our dreams. We do not live only by day. Sometimes we accomplish our greatest deeds and dreams. In that night, my life was threatened since I had to kill my Lord and God, not in a single combat, since who among mortals could kill a God in a duel? You can reach your God only as an assassin if you want to overcome him. But this is the bitterest for mortal men. Our gods want to overcome since they require a renewal. If men kill their princes, they do so because they cannot kill their gods and because they do not know that they should kill their gods themselves. If the god grows old, he becomes shadow, nonsense, and he goes down. The greatest truth becomes the greatest lie. The brightest day becomes darkest night. As day requires night, and night requires day, so meaning requires absurdity, and absurdity requires meaning. Day does not exist through itself. Night does not exist through itself. The reality that exists through itself is day and night, so the reality is meaning and absurdity. Noon is a moment, midnight is a moment, morning comes from night, evening turns into night, but evening comes from the day, and morning turns into day. So meaning is a moment and a transition from absurdity to absurdity, and absurdity only a moment and a tra transition from meaning to meaning. Oh, that Siegfried, blonde and blue-eyed, the German hero, had to fall by my hand, the most loyal and courageous. That was Jung's hero. So he had everything in himself that I treasured as a greater and more beautiful. He was my power, my boldness my pride, I would have gone under this in the same bottle, battle 
and so only assassination assassination was left to me. If I wanted to go on living, it could only be through trickery and cunning. Judge not, think of the blonde savage of the German forest who had to betray the hammer brandishing thunder to the pale near eastern god who was nailed to the wood like a chicken marten. The courageous were overcome by a certain contempt for themselves, but their life force bade them to go on living, and they betrayed their beautiful wild gods, their holy trees and their awe of the German forests. What does Siegfried mean for the Germans? What does it tell us that the Germans suffer Siegfried's death? That is why I almost preferred to kill myself in order to spare him, but I want to go on living with a new god. After death on the cross, Christ went into the underworld and became hell, so he took on the form of the Antichrist, the dragon, the image of the Antichrist, which has come down to us from the ancients, announces the new God, whose coming the ancients, the ancients had foreseen. Gods are unavoidable. The more you flee from God, the more surely you fall into his hand. The rain is the great stream of tears that will come over the peoples. The tearful flood of released tension after cons the constriction of death had encumbered the peoples with horrific force. It is the mourning of the dead in me which precedes burial, burial and rebirth. The rain is the fr fructifying of the earth. It begets the new wheat, the young germinating God. Alright, so the conception of the God. On the second night, thereafter I spoke to my soul and said, this new world appears weak and artificial to me. Artificial is a bad word, but the mustard seed that grew into a tree, the word that was conceived in the womb of a virgin, became a god to whom the earth was subject. As I spoke thus, the spirit of the deaths suddenly erupted. He filled me, filled me with intoxication and mist and spoke these words with a powerful voice. I have received your sprout. You are who are to come. I have received it in the deepest need and low, lowliness i covered it in a shabby patchwork and bedded down on poor words and mockery worshipped it your child your wondrous child the child of one who is to come who should announce the father a fruit that is older than the tree on which it grew in pain will you conceive and joyful is your birth fear is your herald doubt stands to your right disappointment to your left we passed by in our ridiculousness and senselessness when we caught sight of you. Our eyes were blinded and our knowledge fell silent when we received your radiance. You new spark of an eternal fire into which night were you born. You will ring truthful prayers from your believers and they must speak of your glory in tongues that are atrocious to them. You will come over them in the hour of their disgrace and will become known to them in what they hate, fear, and abhor. Your voice, the rarest pleasing sound, will be heard amid the stammerings of wretches, re rejects, and those condemned as worthless. Your realm will be touched by the hands of those who also worshipped before the most profound lowliness, and whose longing drove them through the mud tide of evil. You will give your gifts to those who pray to you in terror and doubt, and your light will shine upon those whose knees bent before you unwillingly, and who are filled with resentment. Your life is with he who has overcome himself, and who has disowned his self-overcoming. I also know that the salvation of mercy is given only to those who believe in the highest and faithlessly, and faithlessly betray themselves for thirty pieces of silver. Those who will dir dirty their pure hands and cheat on their best knowledge against error and take their virtues from a murderer's grave are invited to your great banquet. The consolation of your birth is an ill and chaining star. These, O child of what is to come, are the wonders that will bear testimony that you are veritable God, of, that you are a veritable God. When my prince had fallen, the spirit of the deaths opened my vision and let me become aware of the birth of a new God. The divine child approached me out of the terrible ambiguity, the hateful, beautiful, the evil, good the laughable serious, the sick healthy, the inhuman human, and ungodly godly. I understood that the God whom we seek in the absolute was not to be found in absolute beauty, goodness, seriousness, elevation, humanity, or even in godliness, once the God was there. I understood that the new God would be in the relative, 
If the God is absolute beauty and goodness, how should he encompass the fullness of life, which is beautiful and hateful, good and evil, laughable and serious, human and inhuman? How can man live in the womb of the God if the Godhead himself attends only to one half of him? If we have risen near the heights of good and evil, then our badness and hatefulness lie in the most extreme torment. Man's torment is so great, and the air of the heights so weak that he can hardly live any more. The, the good and the beautiful freeze to the ice of the absolute idea, and the bad and the hateful become mud piles full of crazy life. Therefore, after his death, Christ had to journey to hell. Otherwise, the ascent to heaven would have become impossible for him. Christ first had to become his antichrist, his unworthy brother. No one knows what happened during the three days Christ was in hell. I have experienced it. The men of yore said that he had preached there to the deceased. What they say is true, but you know how this happened. It was folly and monkey business and a atrocious hell's masquerade of the holiest mysteries. How, how else could Christ have saved his Antichrist? Read the unknown books of the ancients and you will learn much from them. Notice that Christ did not remain in hell but rose to the heights in the beyond. Our conviction of the value of the good and beautiful has become strong and unshakable. That is why life can extend beyond this and still fulfill everything that lay bound and yearning. But the bound and yearning, yearning is also the hateful and bad. Are you again indignant about the hateful and the bad? Through this you can recognize how great are their force and value for life. Do you think that this is dead in you? But this dead can also change into serpents. These serpents will extinguish the prince of your days. Do you see what beauty and joy came over men and when the deaths unleashed this greatest war? And yet it was a frightful beginning. If we do not have the deaths, how do we have the heights? Yet you fear the deaths and do not want to confess that you are afraid of them. It is good, though, that you fear yourselves. Say it out loud that you are afraid of yourselves. It is wi wisdom to fear oneself. Only the heroes say that they are fearless, but you know what happens to heroes. With fear and trembling, looking around yourselves with mistrust, go thus into the depths, but do not do this alone. Two or more is greater security since the depths are full of murder. Also secure yourselves the way of retreat. Go cautiously as if you were cowards so that you preempt the soul murderers. The depths would like to devour you whole and choke you in mud. He who journeys to hell also becomes hell. Therefore, do not forget from whence you come. The deaths are stronger than us, so do not be heroes. Be clever and drop the heroics, since nothing is more dangerous than to play the hero. The deaths want to keep you. They have not returned very many up to now, and therefore men fled from the deaths and attacked them. What if the deaths, due to the assault, now chain themselves into death? But the deaths indeed have changed themselves into death. Therefore, when they awake, awoke, they conflicted a thousandfold death. We cannot slay death as we have already taken all life from it. If we still want to overcome death, then we must enliven enliv in it. Therefore, on your journey, be sure to take golden cups full of the sweet drink of life, red wine, and give it to dead matter, so that it can win life back. The dead matter will change into black serpents. Do not be frightened. The serpents will immediately put out the sun of your days. And a night will, wonderful will o' the wisps, will come over you. Take pains to the waken the dead, to waken the dead. Dig deep mines and throw in sacrificial gifts so that they reach the dead. Reflect in good heart upon evil. This is the way to the ascent, but before you ascent, everything is night and hell. What do you think of the essence of hell? Hell is when the deaths come to you with all that you no longer are, or are not yet capable of. Hell is when you can no longer attain what you could attain. Hell is when you must think and feel and do everything that you know you do not want. Hell is when you know that you are having to is also a wanting to, and that you yourself are responsible for it. 
Hell is when you know that everything serious that you have planned with yourself is also laughable. That everything fine is also brutal. That everything good is also bad. That everything high is also low. And that everything pleasant is also shameful. But the deepest hell is when you realize that hell is also no hell, but a cheerful heaven. Not a heaven in itself, but in respect of a heaven and it in that respect to hell. This is the ambiguity of the God. He is born from dark ambiguity and rises to a brighter ambiguity. Unequal, unequivocalness is simplicity and leads to death. But ambiguity is the way of life. If the left foot does not move, then the right one does. And you move the God. And you move. The God wills this. You say the Christian God is unequivocal. He is love. But what is more ambiguous than love? Love is the way of life, but your love is only on the way of life if you have left you if you have a left and a right. Nothing is easier than to play at ambiguity, and nothing is more difficult than living ambiguity. He who plays is a child, his god is old and dies. He who lives is awakened, his god is young and goes on. He who plays hides from the inner death. He who lives the going onward and immortality. So leave the play to the players, let fall what wants to fall. If you stop it, it will sweep you away. There is a true love that does not concern itself with neighbors. When the hero was slain in the meaning recognized in the absurdity, when all tension came rushing down from gravid clouds, when everything had become cowardly and looked to its own rescue, I became aware of the birth of the God. Opposing me, the God sank into my heart when I was confused by mockery and worship, by grief and laughter, by yes and no. The one arose from the melting together of the two, he was born as a child from my own human soul, which had conceived him with resistance like a virgin. Thus it corresponds to the image that the ancients have given us. But when the mother in my soul was pregnant with the God, I did not know it. It even seemed to me as if my soul herself was the God, although he lived only in her body. And thus the image of the ancients is fulfilled. I pursued my soul to kill the child in it. For I am also the worst enemy of my God, but I also recognize that my and 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 sorry, enmity is decided upon in the God. He is mockery and hate and anger, since this is also a way of life. I must also say, I must say that the God could not come into being before the hero had been slain. The hero, as we understand him, has become a, an enemy of the God. Since the hero is perfection, the gods envy the perfection of man, because perfection has no need of the gods. But since no one is perfect, we need the gods. The gods love, love perfection because it is the total way of life. But the gods are not with him who chooses to be perfect, perfect because he is an imitation of perfection. Imitation was a way of life when men still needed the heroic prototype, the Monkey's manner is a way of life for monkeys, and for man, as long as he is like a monkey, human apishness has lasted a terribly long time. But the time will come when a piece of that apishes, apishness will fall away from men. That will be a time of salvation, and the dove, and the internal fire, and redemption will descend. Then there will no longer be a hero, and no one who can imitate him, because from that time henceforth, all imitation is cursed. The new God laughs, laughs at imitation and discipleship. He needs no imitators and no pupils. He forces men through himself. The God is his own follower in a man. He imitates himself if we think that there is singleness within us, and commonality outside us. Outside of us is the communal in relation to the external, while singleness refers to us. 
we are single if we are in ourselves, but communal in relation to in relation to what is outside us. But if we are outside of ourselves and we are single and selfish selfish in the communal, our self suffers privation if we are outside ourselves, and thus it's it is satis it satisfies its need with communality. Consequently, communality is distorted into singleness. If we are in ourselves, we fulfill the need of the self. We prosper, and through this, we become aware of the needs of the communal and can, can, and can fulfill them. Okay. If we set a God outside of ourselves, he tears us loose from the self. Since the God is more pow powerful than we are, our self falls into the privation, but if the God moves into the self, he snatches us from what is outside us. We arrive at singleness in ourselves. So the God becomes communal in reference to what is outside us, but single in relation to us. No one has my God, but my God has everyone, including myself. The gods of all individual men are always, men always have all other men, including myself. So it is always only the one God, despite his multiplicity. You will arrive at him in yourself and only through yourself, seizing you. He seizes you in the advancement of your life. The hero must fall for the sake of our redemption, since he is the model and demands imitation. But the measure of imitation is fulfilled. We should become reconciled to solitude in ourselves and to the God outside of us. If we enter into this solitude, then the life of the God begins. If we are in ourselves, then the space around us is free, but fill, filled by the God. Our relations to men go through this empty space and also through the God. But earlier, it went through selfishness since we were outside ourselves. Therefore, the Spirit foretold to me that the cold of, our, of outer space will spread across the earth. With this, he showed me an image that the God will step between men and drive every individual with the whip of icy cold to the warmth of his monastic hearth because people were beside themselves going into raptures like madmen. Selfish desire ultimately desires itself. You find yourself in your desire, so do not say that desire is vain. If you desire yourself, you, divide, you produce the divine son. In your embrace with yourself, your desire is the father of the God. Yourself is the mother of the God, but the son is the new God, your master. If you embrace yourself, then it will appear to you as if the world has become cold and empty. The coming God moves into this emptiness. If you are in your solitude and all the space around you has become cold and unending, then you have moved far from men, and at the same time you have come near to them as never before. Selfish desire only apparently led you to men, but in reality, it led you away from them and in the end to yourself, which to you and to others was the most remote. But now, if you are in solitude, your God leads you to the God of others and through that to the true neighbor, to the neighbor of the self and others. If you are in yourself, you become aware of your incapacity. You will see how little capable you are of imitating the heroes and of being a hero yourself. So you will also no longer force others to become heroes. Like you, they suffer from incapacity. Incapacity, too, wants to live, but it will overthrow your gods. Alright. This is my favorite passage. I think it's the most important to me. Um, if you guys have been listening, you guys should be trying to get a sense of what um, speaks to you. But um, I'll begin this passage, Mysterium Encounter. So in the in this photo, we have, uh, you can see Elijah and Shalom. Me and Shalom is this blind lady that's uh, not really. And then um, Elijah is this wise old man. Yeah. So on the night when I considered the essence of the God, I became aware of it, of an image. I lay in a dark death. 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 
An old man stood before me. He looked like one of the old prophets. A black serpent lay at his feet. Some distance away, I saw a house with columns. A beautiful maiden steps out of the door. She walks uncertainly, and I see that she is blind. The old man waves to me, and I follow him to the house at the foot of the sheer wall of rock. The serpent creeps behind us. Darkness reigns inside the house. We are in a high hall with glittering walls. A bright stone, the color of water, lies in the background. As I look into it, its reflection. The images of Eve, the tree, and the serpent appear to me. After this, I catch sight of Odysseus and his journey on the high seas. Suddenly, a door opens on the right onto a garden full of bright sunshine. We step outside, and the old man says to me, Do you know where you are? I, referring to Young, I am a stranger here, and everything seems strange to me, anxious as in a dream. Who are you? E, which refers to Elijah. I am Elijah, and this is my daughter Salome. I, the daughter of Herod, the bloodthirsty woman. E, why do you judge so? You see that she is blind. She is my daughter, the daughter of the prophet. I, what mir miracle has united you? E, it is no miracle. It was so from the beginning. My wisdom and my daughter are one. I am shocked. I am incapable. So sorry. I am shocked. I am incapable of grasping it. E. Consider this. Her blindness and my sight have made us companions through eternity. I. Forgive my astonishment. Am I truly in the world, in the underworld? S. Salome. Do you love me? I. How can I love you? How do you come to this question? I see only one thing. You are Salome, a tiger. Your hands are stained with the blood of the Holy One. How should I love you? Salome, you will love me. I, I love you. Who gives you the right to such quest, to such thoughts? S, I love you. I, leave me be. I dread you, you beast. S, you do me wrong. Elijah is my father and he knows the deepest mysteries. The walls of his house are made of precious stones. His wells hold healing water and his eyes see the things of the future. And what wouldn't you give for a single look into the infinite unfolding of what is to come? Are these not worth the sin for you? I, your temptation is devilish. I long to be back in, in the upper world. It is dreadful here. How oppressive and heavy is the air. E, what do you want? The choice is yours. I, but I do not belong to the dead. I live in the light of the day. Why should I torment myself here with Salome? Do I not have enough of my own life to deal with? E. You heard what Salome said. I. I cannot believe that you, the prophet, can recognize her as a daughter and a companion. Is she not engendered from heinous seed? Was she not vain greed and criminal lust? E. But she loved the holy man. I. And shamefully shed his precious blood. E. She loved the prophet who announced the new God to the world. She loved him. Do you understand that? For she is my daughter. I. Do you think that because she is your daughter, she loved the prophet in John the father? E. By her love sh shall you know her. I. But how did she love him? Do you call that love? E. What else was it? I. I am horrified. Who wouldn't be horrified if Salome loved him? E. Are you cowardly? Consider this, I and my daughter have been one since eternity. I, you pose dreadful riddles. How could it be that this unholy woman and you, the prophet of your God, could be one? E, why are you amazed? But you see it, we are, you see it, we are together. I, what my eyes see is exactly what I cannot grasp. You, Elijah, who are a prophet, the mouth of God, and she, a bloodthirsty horror. You are the symbol of the most extreme contradiction. E, we are real and not symbols. I, I see how the black serpent writhes up the tree and hides in the branches. Everything becomes gloomy and doubtful. Elijah rises. I follow and we go silently back through the hall. Doubt tears, my, me, tears me apart. It is all so unreal and yet a part of my longing remains behind. Will I come again? Salome loves me. Do I love her? 
I hear wild music, a tambourine, a sultry moonlit night, the bloody starring, staring head of the Holy One. Fear seizes me. I rush out. I am surrounded by the dark night. It is pitch black all around me. Who murdered the hero? Is this why Salome loves me? Do I love her and I, did I therefore murder the hero? She is one with the prophet, one with John, but also one with me. Woe, she, woe, was she the hand of the God? I do not love her, I fear her. Then the spirit of death spoke to me and said, Therein you acknowledge her divine power. Must I love Salome? This play that I witnessed is my play, not your play. This is um in italics. So this play that I witnessed is my play, not your play. It is my secret, not yours. You cannot imitate me. My secret remains virginal, and my mysteries are inviolable. Sorry, they belong to me and cannot belong to you. You have your own. So, just skip over a bit. The scene of the mystery play is a deep place, like the crater of a volcano. My deep interior is a volcano that pushes out the fiery molten mass of the unformed and the undifferentiated. Thus my interior gives birth to the children of chaos, of the primordial mother. He who enters the crater also becomes chaotic matter. He melts. The formed in him dissolves and binds itself anew with the children of chaos, the power of darkness, the ruling and the seducing, the compelling and the alluring, the divine and the devilish. These powers stretch beyond my certainty, certainties and limits on all sides and connect me with all forms and with all distant beings and things through which inner tidings of their being and their character develop in me. Because I have fallen into the source of chaos, into the primordial beginning, I myself have become smelted anew in the new connection with the primordial beginning, which at the same time is what has been and what is becoming. At first I come to the primordial beginning in myself, but because I am part of the matter and formation of the world, I also come into the primordial beginning of the world in the first place. I have certainly participated in life as someone formed and determined, but only through my formed and determined consciousness and through this in a formed and determined piece of the whole world, but not in the unformed and undetermined aspect of the world that likewise are given to me. Yet it is given only to my depths, not to my surface, which, which is formed in determined consciousness. The power of my depths are predetermination and pleasure. Predetermination or forethinking is Prometheus, who without determined thoughts brings the chaotic, chaotic to form, and definition who digs the, the channels and holds the object before pleasure. Forethinking also comes before thought. But pleasure is a force that desires and destroys forms without form and definition. It loves the form in its in it in itself that it takes hold of and destroys a form that it does not take. The forethinker is a seer, but pleasure is blind. It does not foresee, but desires what it touches. Forethinking is not powerful in itself, and therefore it does not move. But pleasure is power, and therefore it moves. Forethinking needs pleasure to be able to come to form pleasure needs forethinking to come to form which it requires if pleasure lacked form yeah i'll stop there if pleasure lacked form forming pleasure would dissolve in manifoldness and become splintered and powerless through unending division lost to the unending if a form does not contain and compress pleasure within itself it cannot reach the higher, since since it always flows like water from above to below. All pleasure, when left alone, flows into the deep end and ends in the de deathly stillness of dispersal into unending space. Pleasure is not older than forethinking, and forethinking is not older than pleasure. Both are equally old and in nature intimately one. Only in man does the separate existence of both principles become apparent. Apart from Elijah and Salome, I found the serpent as a third principle. It is a stranger to both principles, although it is associated with both. 
the serpent taught me the unconditional difference in essence between the two principles in me. If I look across from forethinking to pleasure, I first see the de deterrent poisonous serpent. If I feel from pleasure across to forethinking, likewise I feel first the cold, cruel serpent. The serpent is the earthly essence of man, essence of man of which he is not conscious. Its character changes according to peoples and lands, since it is the mystery that flows to him from the nourishing earth mother. The earthly separates forethinking and pleasure in man, but not in itself. The serpent was the weight of the earth in itself, but also its changeability and germination, germination from which everything that becomes emerges. It is always a serpent that causes man to become enslaved now to one, now to the now to one, now to the other principle, so that it becomes error. One cannot live with forethinking alone or with pleasure alone. You need both, but you cannot be in forethinking and in pleasure at the same time. You must take turns being in forethinking and pleasure, obeying the prevailing law, unfaithful to the other, so to speak, but men prefer one or the other. Some love thinking and establish the art of life on it. They practice their thinking and their circumspection, so they lose their pleasure. Therefore, they are old and have a sharp face. The others love pleasure. They practice their feelings and living. Thus, they forget thinking. Therefore, they are young and blind. Those who think base the world on thought. Those who feel on feeling, you find truth and error in both. The way of life writes like the serpent from right to left, from left to right, from thinking to pleasure and from pleasure to thinking. Thus the serpent is an adversary and a symbol of enmity, but also a wise bridge that connects right and left through longing much needed by our life. The place where Elijah and Salome live together is a dark space and a bright one. The dark space is the space of forethinking. It is dark. So he who lives there requires vision. This space is limited, so forethinking does not lead into the extended distance, but into the depths of the past and the future. The crystal is a form of thought that reflects what is to come and what has gone before. Even the serpent showed me that my next step leads to pleasure, and from there again on lengthy wanderings like Odysseus. He went astray when he played his trick at Troy, the bright garden is the space of pleasure. He who lives there needs no vision. He feels the unending. A thinker who descends into his forethinking finds his next step leading into the garden of Salome. Therefore, the thinker fears his forethought, although he lives on the foundation of forethinking. The visible surface is safer than the underground. Thinking protects against the way of error, and therefore it leads to petrification. A thinker should fear Salome, since she wants his head, especially if he is a holy man. A thinker cannot be a holy person, otherwise he loses his head. It does not help to hide oneself in thought. There the solidification overtakes you. You must turn back to motherly forethought to obtain renewal, but forethought leads to Salome. Because I was a thinker and caught sight of the hostile principle of pleasure from forethinking, it appeared to me as Salome. If I had been one who felt and had groped my way toward forethinking, then it would have appeared to me as a serpent and coiled daemon if I had actually seen it. But I would have been blind, therefore I would have felt only slippery, dead, dangerous, allegedly overcome, insipid and mawkish things. And I would have pulled back with the same shudder I felt in turning from Salome. The thinker's passions are bad, therefore he has no pleasure. The thoughts of one who feels are bad, therefore he has no thoughts. He who prefers to think than to feel lives his feelings to rot in darkness. It's, it does not grow ripe, but in moldiness produces sick tendrils that do not reach the light. He who prefers to feel than to think li leaves his thinking in darkness where it spins its nest in gloomy places, desolate webs in, in which mosquitoes and gnats become enmeshed. The thinker feels the di disgust of feeling, since the feeling in him is mainly disgusting. The one who feels thinking 
The one who feels thinks the disgust of thinking, since the thinking in him is mainly disgusting. So the serpent lies between the thinker and the one who feels. They are each other's poison and healing. In the garden, it had to become apparent to me that I loved Salome. This recognition struck me, since I had not thought it. What a thinker does not think, he believes, does not exist. And what one who feels does not feel, he believes, does not exist. You begin to have a presentiment of the whole when you embrace your opposite principle, since the whole belongs to both principles, which grow from root. Elijah said, you should recognize her through her love. Not only do you venerate the object, but the object also sacrifices you. So Lomi loved the prophet, and this sanctified her. The prophet loved God, and this sanctified him. But Salome did not love God, and this profaned her. But the prophet did not love Salome, and this profaned him. And thus they were each other's poison and death. May the thinking person accept his pleasure, and the feeling person accept his own thought. Such leads one along the way. Yeah, I really like that passage. All right, so this is the second last passage in the first book of the Red Book, Lever uh, Primus. So instruction. On the following night, I was led to a second image. I am standing in the rocky depth that seems to me like a crater. Before me, I see the house with columns. I see Salome walking along the length of the wall toward the left, touching the wall like a blind person. The serpent follows her. The old man stands at the door and waves to me. Hesitantly, I draw closer. He calls Salome back. She is like someone suffering. I cannot detect any sacrilege in her nature. Her hands are white and her face has a gentle expression. The serpent lies before them. I stand before them clumsily like a stupid boy. Overwhelmed, overwhelmed by uncertain, uncertainty and ambiguity, the old, man, the old man eyes me searchingly and says, What do you want here? I, Carl Jung, forgive me. It is not obtrusiveness or arrogance that leads me here. I am here perchance, not knowing what I want. A longing that stayed behind in your house yesterday has brought me here. You see, prophet, I am tired. I am tired too. I am tired. My head is as heavy as lead. I am lost in my ignorance. I have toyed with myself long enough. I played hypocritical games with myself, and they all would have disgusted me were it not clever to perform what others expect from us in the world of men. It seems to me as if I were more real here, and yet I do not like being here. Wordlessness, wordlessly, Elijah and Salome step inside the house. I follow them reluctantly. A feeling of guilt torments me. Is it bad conscience? I would like to turn back, but I cannot. I stand before the play of fire in the shining crystal. I see in the splendor in splendor, the mother of God with the child. Peter stands in front of her in admiration, and Peter alone with the key, the Pope, Pope with the triple crown, 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 a Buddha sitting rigidly in a circle of fire, an armed, a many-armed bloody goddess, it is Salome, desperately wringing her hands. It takes hold of me. She is my own soul. And now I see Elijah in the image of the stone. Elijah and Salome stand smiling before me. These visions are full of torment. Or sorry, I. These visions are full of torment and the meaning of these images is dark to me. Elijah, please shed some light. Elijah turns away silently and leads the way toward the left. Salome enters a colonnade to the right. Elijah leads me into an even dar darker room. A burning red lamp hangs from the ceiling. I sit down exhausted. Elijah stands before me, leaning on a marble lion in the middle of the room. E, which is Elijah. Are you anxious? Your ignorance is to blame for your bad conscience. 
not knowing is guilt, but you believe that is it is the urge toward forbidden knowledge that causes your feeling of guilt. Why do you think you are here? I, I don't know. I sank into this place when unknowingly I tried resisting the not known. So here I am, astonished and confused, an ignorant fool. I experienced strange things in your house, things that frightened me and whose meaning is dark to me. E, if it were not your law to be here, how would you be here? I, I'm afflicted by fl fatal weakness, my father. E, you are evasive. Sorry. You are evasive. You cannot extricate yourself from your law. How can I extricate myself from what is unknown to me, which I cannot reach with either feeling or presentiment? E, you are lying. Do you not know that you yourself recognized what it means if Salome loves you? I, you are right. A doubtful and uncertain thought arose in me, but I have forgotten it again. E, you have not forgotten it. It burned deep inside you. Are you cowardly? Or can you not differentiate this thought from your own self, enough so that you wish to claim it for yourself? I, the thought went too far for me, and I shun far-fetched ideas. They are dangerous. Since I am a man, and you know how much men are accustomed to seeing thoughts as their very own, so that they eventually confuse them with themselves. E, will you therefore confuse yourself with a tree or animal? Because you look at them, and because you exist with them in one and the same world? Must you be your thoughts, because you are in the world of your thoughts? But your thoughts are just as much outside yourself as trees, and animals are outside your body. I, I understand my thought world, oh sorry, I understand. My thought world was, for me, more wor word than world. I thought of my thought world, it is I. Do you say to your human world and every being outside of you, you are I? I, I stepped into your house, my father, with the fear of a schoolboy, but you taught me solitary wisdom. I can also consider my thoughts as being outside myself. That helps me to return to that terrible conclusion that my tongue is reluctant to express. I thought that Salome loves me because I resemble John or you. This thought seemed unbelievable to me. That's why I rejected it and thought that she loves me because I am really quite opposite to you, that she loves her badness in my badness. This thought was devastating. Elijah is silent. Heaviness lies on me. Then Salome steps in and comes over to me and lays her arm around my shoulder. She takes me for her father in whose chair I sat. I dare neither move nor spoke or speak Salome S I know that you are not my father you are his son and I am your sister I you Salome my sister was this a terrible attraction that emanated from you that una unnameable horror of you of your touch who was our mother S Mary I is it a hellish dream, Mary, our mother? What madness lurks in your words, the mother of our Savior? Our mother, when I cross you, your threshold, today I foresaw calamity. Alas, it has come. Are you out of your senses, Salome? Elijah, protector of the divine law, speak. Is this a devilish spell cast by the rejected? How can she say such thing? Or are both of you out of your senses? You are symbols, and Mary is a symbol. I am simply too confused to see through you now. E. You may call us symbols for the same reason that you can call your fellow men symbols, if you wish to, but we are just as real as your fellow men. You invalidate nothing and solve nothing by calling us symbols. I. You plunge me into a terrible confusion. Do you wish to be real? E. We are certainly what you call real. Here we are. And you have to accept us. The choice is yours. I am so silent. So Salome has re removed herself. Uncertainly, I look around. 
Behind me, a high golden red flame burns on a round altar. The serpent has encircled the flame. Its eyes glitter with golden reflections. Swaying, I turn to the exit. As I step out into the hall, I see a pow powerful lion going before me. Outside, it is a wide, um, outside, it is a wide, cold, starry night. It is no small matter to acknowledge one's yearning. For this, men, for this, many need to make a particular effect at honesty. All too many do not want to know where their yearning is, because it would seem them, to them impossible or too distressing. And yet, yearning is the way of life. If you do not acknowledge your yearning, then you do not follow yourself but go on a foreign ways that others have indicated to you. Right, so this is what I was trying to say. Like, don't do what everyone else does. So you do not live your life but in an alien one. But who should live your life if you do not believe it? It is not only stupid to exchange your own life for an alien one, but also a hypocritical game. Because deceiving... Sorry, because you can never really live the life of others. You can only pretend to do, to do it, deceiving the other and yourself, since you can only live your own life. If you give up yourself, you live it in others. Thereby, you become selfish to others, and thus you deceive others. Everyone thus believes that such life, such a life, is possible. It is, however, only apish imitation. Through giving it, through giving in it. Sorry, I'm getting pretty tired. Uh, let's see here. Through giving in to your apish appetite, you infect others because the ape stimulates the apish. So you turn yourself and others into apes. Through reci reciprocal imitation, you live according to the average expectation. The image of the hero was set up for all in every age through the appetite for imitation. Therefore, the hero was murdered since we have all been aping him. Do you know why you cannot abandon apishness for fear of loneliness and defeat? To live oneself means to be one's own task. Never say that it is, it is a pleasure to live oneself. It will be no joy but a long suffering, since you must become your own creator. If you want to create yourself, then you do not begin with the best and the highest, but with the worst and the deepest. Therefore, say that you are reluctant to live yourself. The flowing together of the stream of life is not joy but pain, since it is power against power, guilt and the shatters, and guilt and shatters the sanctified. The image of the mother of God with the child that I foresee indicates to me the mystery of the transformation. If four thinking and pleasures unite in me, a third arises from them, the divine son. Who is the supreme meaning? The symbol, the passing over into a new creation. I do not myself become the supreme meaning or or the symbol. But the symbol becomes in me such that it has its substance and I mine. Thus I stand like Peter in worship before the miracle of the transformation and the becoming real of the God in me. Although I am not the son of the God myself, I represent him nevertheless as one who was a mother to the God and one therefore to whom in the name of the God the freedom of the binding and losing has been given. The binding and losing takes place in me, but in so far as it takes place in me and I am a part of the world, it also takes place through me in the world and no one can hinder it. It doesn't take place, take place according to the way of my will, but in the way of unavoidable effect. I am not master over you, but the being of the God in me. I lock the past with one key, with the other I open the future. This takes place through my transformation. The miracle of transformation commands. I am its ser servant just as the Pope is. You see how incredible it was to believe such of oneself. It implies not to me, but to the symbol. The symbol becomes my lord and unfailing commander. It will fortify its reins and change itself into a fixed and riddling image. 
whose meaning turns completely inward and whose pleasure radiates outward like a blazing fire, a Buddha in the flames, because I sink into my symbol to such an extent, the symbol changes me from my one into my other, and that cruel goddess of my interior, my womanly pleasure, my own other, the tormented tormentor, that which is to be tormented. I have interpreted these images as best I can with poor words. In the moment of your bewilderment, follow your forethinking and not your blind desire, since forethinking leads you to the difficulties that should always come first. They come nevertheless. If you look for a light, you fall first into an even dark, deeper darkness. In this darkness, you will find a light with a weak reddish flame that gives only a low brightness, but it is enough for you to see your neighbor. It is exhausting to reach this goal that seems to be no goal, and so it is good. I am paralyzed and therefore ready to accept my forethinking. Rest on the lion, my power. I held to the sanctified form and didn't want to allow the chaos to break through its dams. I believed in the order of the world and hated everything disorganized and unformed. Therefore, above all, I had to realize that my own law had brought me to this place. As the God developed in me, I thought he was a part of myself. I thought that my I included him, and therefore I took him for my thought. But I also considered that my thoughts were parts of my I. Thus I entered into my thoughts and into the thinking about the God, and I took him for a part of myself. On account of my thoughts, I had left myself. Therefore myself became hungry and made God, God into a selfish, selfish thought. If I leave myself, my hunger will drive me to find myself in my object, that is, in my thought. Therefore, you love reasonable, reasonable and orderly thoughts since you could not endure it if yourself was in disorder. That is, unsuitable thoughts. Through your selfish wish, you pushed out of your thoughts everything that you do not consider ordered. That is, unfitting. You create order according to what you know. You do not know the thoughts of chaos, and yet they exist. My thoughts are not myself, and my eye does not embrace the thought. Your thought has this meaning and that, not just one, but many meanings. No one knows how many. My thoughts are not myself, but exactly like the things of the world, alive and dead. Just as I am not damaged through living in a partly chaotic world, so too I am, a, I am not damaged if I live in my partly chaotic thought world. Thoughts are natural events that you do not possess, and whose meaning you and only you only imperfectly, imperfectly recognize. Thoughts grow in me like a forest populated by many different animals. But man is domineering in his thinking, and therefore he kills the pleasure of the forest and that of the wild animals. Man is violent in his desire, and he himself becomes a forest and a forest animal. Just as I have freedom in the world, I also have freedom in my thoughts. Freedom is conditional. To certain things of the world, I must say, you should not be thus, but you should be different. Yet first, I look carefully at their nature. Otherwise, I cannot change it. I proceed in the same way with certain thoughts. You change those things of the world that not being useful in themselves endanger your welfare. Proceed likewise with your thoughts. Nothing is complete and much is in dispute. The way of life is transformation, not exclusion. Well-being is a better judge than the law. But as I became aware of the freedom in my thought world, Salome embraced me, and th I thus became a prophet. Since I had found pleasure in the primordial beginning, in the forest, and in the wild animals, it stands too close to reason for me to set myself on par with my visions, and for me to take pleasure in seeing. I am in danger of believing that I myself am significant since I see the significant. This will always drive us crazy, and we transform the vision into foolishness and monkey business since we cannot desist from imitation. 
Just as my thinking is the son of forethinking, so is my pleasure the daughter of love, of the innocent and conceiving mother of God. Aside from Christ, Mary gave birth to Salome. Therefore Christ, in the gospel of the Egyptians, says to Salome, Eat every herb, but do not eat the bitter. And when Salome wanted to know Christ, spoke to her. If you crush the covering of shame, and when the two become one, and the male with the female, neither male nor female. Forethinking is the procreative. Love is the receptive. Both are beyond this world. Here are, under, here are understanding and pleasure. We only suspect the other. It would be madness to claim that they are in this world. So much that is riddling and cunning coils around this light. I won the power back again from the depths, and it went before me like a lion. Right, so we're in the last passage of the Red Book. It's been a long reading, or sorry, Red Book uh, Liber Primus. We still have another book. But um, let's conclude. Resolution. On the third night, deep longing to continue experience the mystery seized me. The struggle between doubt and desire was great in me, but suddenly I saw that I stood before a steep ridge in a wasteland. It is a dazzling bright day. I catch sight of the prophet high above me. His hand makes me an adverting, an averting movement, and I abandon my decision to climb up. I wait below, gazing up upward. I wait below, gazing upward. I look to the right. It is dark night. To the left is bright day. The rock separates day and night. On the dark side, side lies a big black serpent. On the brighter side, a white serpent. They thrust their heads toward, toward each other, eager for battle. Elijah stands on the heights above them. The serpents pounce on one another, and a terrible wrestling ensues. The black serpent seems to be stronger. The white serpent draws back. Great billows of dust rise from the place of struggle. But then I see the black serpent pulls itself back again. The front part of its body has become white. Both serpents curl about themselves, one in light, the other in darkness. Elijah, is Elijah speaking. What did you see? I, Carl Jung. I saw the fight of two formidable serpents. It seemed to me as if the black would overcome the white serpent, but behold, the black one withdrew, and its head on the top of part, and its head and the top part of its body had turned white. E. Elijah, do you understand that? I. I have thought it over, but I cannot understand it. Should it mean that the power of the good light will become so great that even in that even the darkness that resists it will be illuminated, illumined by it. Elijah climbs before me into the heights, to a very high summit. I follow. On the peak we come to some masonry made of huge blocks. It is a round embarkment on the summit. Inside lies a large courtyard. And there is a mighty boulder. In the middle, like an altar, the prophet stands on the stone. And says, This is the temple of the sun. This place is a vessel that collects the light of the sun. Elijah climbs down from the stone. His form becomes smaller in descending. And finally becomes dwarf-like. Unlike him. I ask, who are you? I am Mime. And I will show you the well springs. The collected light becomes water and flows in many springs from the summit into the valleys of the earth. He then dives in. He then dives down into a crevice. I follow him down into a dark cave. I hear the rippling of a spring. I hear the voice of the dwarf from below. Here are my, here are my wells. Whoever drinks from them becomes wise. But I cannot reach down. I lose courage. I leave the cave and doubting pace back and forth in the square of the yard. Everything appears to me strange and in incomprehensible. It is solitary and deathly silent here. The air is clear and cool as on the remotest heights. A wonderful flood of sunlight all around. The great wall surrounds me. A serpent crawls over the stone. It is the serpent of the prophet. 
How did, it, how did it come out of the underworld into the world above? I follow it and see how it crawls into the wall. I feel weird all over. A little house stands there with a port, portico, portico, minuscule, snuggling against a rock. The serpents become infinitely small. I feel as if I, I too am shrinking. The walls enlarge into a huge mountain, and I see that I am below on the foundation of the crater in the out underworld. And I stand before the house of the prophet. He steps out of the door of his house. I. I notice, Elijah, that you have shown me and let me experience all sorts of strange things and allowed me to come before you today. But I confess that it, it, that it is all too dark to me. Your world appears to me today in a new light. Just now, it, I, just now, it was as if I were separated by a starry distance from your place, which I still wanted to reach today. But behold, it seems to be one in the same place. E. You wanted to come here far too much. I did not deceive you. You deceive yourself. He sees badly who wants to see. You have overreached yourself. I. It is true, I eagerly long to reach you, to hear more. Salome startled me and led me into bewilderment. I felt dizzy because what she said seemed to me to be monstrous and like madness. Where is Salome? How, imp imp how impetuous you are. What is up with you? Step over to the crystal and pre prepare yourself in its light. A wreath of fire shines around the stone i am seized with fear at what i see the coarsest peasant's boot the foot of a giant that crushes an entire city i see the cross the removal of the cross the mourning how ag how agonizing this sight is no longer do i yearn i see the divine child with the white serpent in his right hand and the black serpent in his left hand i see the green mountain the cross of christ on it a stream of blood flowing from the summit of the mountain. I can look no longer. It is unbearable. I see the cross and Christ on it in his last hour in torment. At the foot of the cross, the black serpent coils itself. It has wound itself around my feet. It has wound itself around my feet. I am held fast and I spread my arms wide. Salome draws near. The serpent has wound itself around my whole body and my countenance is that of a lion salome says mary was the mother of christ do you understand i i see that a terrible and, and incomprehensible power forces me to imitate the lord in his final torment but how can i presume to call mary my mother s salome you are christ i stand with outstretched oh sorry i stand with outstretched arms like someone crucified my body taut and horribly entwined by the serpent. You, Salome, say that I am Christ? <laughs> it is as if I stood alone on a high mountain with stiff outstretched arms. The serpent squeezes my body in its terrible coils, and the blood streams from my body, spilling down the mountainside. Salome bends down to my feet and wraps her black hair around them. She lies thus for a long time, then she cries, I see light. Truly, she sees her eyes are open. The serpent falls from my body and lies languid, languidly on the ground. I strive over it and kneel at the feet of the prophet, whose form shines like a flame. E, your work is fulfilled here. Other things will come. Seek untiringly and above all, write exactly what you see. Salome looks in rapture at the light that streams from the prophet. Elijah transforms, transforms into a huge flame of white light. The serpent wraps itself around her foot as if paralyzed. Salome kneels before the light in one destruct devotion. Te tears fall from my eyes and I hurry out into the night. Like one who has no part in the glory of the mystery. My feet do not touch the ground of this earth and it and it is as if I were melting into air.
My longing led me up to the overbright day, whose light is the opposite to the dark space of forethinking. The opposite principle is, as I think I understand it, heavenly love, the mother, the darkness that surrounds forethinking, appears to be due to the fact that it is invisible in the interior and takes place in the depths. But the brightness of love seems to come from the fact that love is visible life and action. My pleasure was with forethinking, and it had its merry garden there, surrounded by darkness and night. I clambered down to my pleasure, but ascended to, lo- to my love. I see Elijah high above me. This indicates that forethinking stands nearer to love than I am. Do. Sorry, that I, a man, do. Before I ascend, before I ascend to love. A condition must be fulfilled, which represents itself as a fight as the fight between two serpents. Left is day, right is night. The realm of love is light. The realm of forethinking is dark. Both principles have separated themselves strict, strictly, and are even hostile to one another, and have taken on the form of serpents. This form indicates the da- demonic nature of both principles. I recognize this. I recognize in this a struggle, a repetition of that vision where I saw the struggle between the sun and the black serpent. At that time, the loving light was annihilated, and blood began to pour out. This was a great war, but the spirit of the deaths wants this struggle to be understood as a conflict in every man's own nature, since after the death of the hero, our urge to live could no longer. Imitate anything. It therefore went into the depths of every man, and excited the terrible conflict between the power of the depths. For thinking is singleness, love is togetherness. Both need one another, and yet they kill one another. Since men do not know that the conflict occurs inside themselves, they go mad, and one lays the blame on the other. If one half of mankind is at fault, then every man is at. Is half at fault, but he does not see the conflict in his own soul, which is, however, the source of the outer disaster. If you are aggravated against your brother, think that you are aggravated against the brother in you, that is, against what you, what in you is similar to your brother. As a man, you are part of mankind, and therefore you have a share in the whole of mankind. As if you were the whole of mankind, if you overpower and kill your fellow man who is contrary to you, then you also kill that person in yourself and have murdered a part of your life. The spirit of this dead man follows you and does not let your life become joyful. You need your wholeness to live onward. If I myself enjoy the endorse the pure principle, I step to one side and become one-sided. Therefore, my forethinking. In the principle of the heavenly mother becomes an ugly dwarf, who lives in a dark cave like an unborn in the womb. You do not follow him, even if he says to you that you could drink wisdom from his source. Before thinking appears to you there as a dwarf, as dwarfish cleverness, false and of of the night, just as heavenly as the heavenly mother appears to me down there as Salome. That which is lacking in the pure principle appears as the serpent. The hero strives after the utmost in the pure principle, and therefore he finally falls for the serpent. If you go to thinking, take your heart with you. If you go to love, take your head with you. Love is empty without thinking. Thinking, hollow, without love. The serpent lurks behind the pure principle. Therefore, I lost courage, until I found the serpent that at once led me across to the other principle. In climbing down, I become smaller. Great is he who is in love, since love is the present act of the great Creator, the present moment of the becoming and lapsing of the world. Mighty is he who loves, but whoever distances himself, whoever distances himself from love, feels himself powerful. In your forethinking, you recognize the nullity of your current being as a, a smallest point between the infinity. Of what has passed and of what is to come, 
The thinker is small. He feels great if he distances himself from thinking. But if we speak about appearances, it is the other way around. To whoever is in love, form is a trifling. But his field of vision ends with the form, form given to him. To whoever is in thinking, form is unsurpassable and the height of heaven. But at night he sees the diversity of the innumerable, in, innumerable worlds and their never-ending cycles. Whoever is in love is a full and overflowing vessel and awaits the giving. Whoever is in forethinking is deep and hollow and awaits fulfillment. Love and, and forethinking are in one in the same place. Love cannot be without forethinking, and forethinking cannot be without love. Man is always too much in one or the other. This comes from human nature. Animals and plants seem to have enough in every way. Only man staggers between too much and too little. He wavers. He is uncertain. How much he must give here and how much there. His knowledge and ability is insufficient, and yet he must still do it himself. Man doesn't only grow from within himself, for he is also creative from within himself. The God becomes revealed in him. Human nature is little skilled in divinity, and therefore man fluctuates between too much and too little. The spirit of this time has condemned us to haste. You have no more futurity and no more past if you serve the spirit of this time. We need the life of eternity. We bear the future and the past and the deaths. The future is old and the past is young. You serve the spirit of this time and believe that you are able to escape the spirit of the deaths. But the deaths do not hesitate any longer and will force you into the mysteries of Christ. It belongs to this mystery that a man is not redeemed through the hero, but becomes a Christ himself. The antidote antecedent example of the saints symbolically teaches us this. Whoever wants to see will see badly. It was my will that deceived me. It was my will that provoked the huge uproar among the demons. Should I therefore not want anything? I have, and I have fulfilled my will as well as I could. And thus I fed everything in me that strived. In the end I found out that I wanted myself in everything, but without looking for myself. Therefore I, w I no longer wanted to seek myself outside of myself, but within. Then I wanted to grasp myself, and then I wanted to go on again without knowing what I wanted, and thus I fell into the mystery. Should I therefore not want anything any more? You wanted this war. That is good. If you had not, then the evil of this war would be small. But with your wanting, you make the evil great. If you do not succeed in producing the greatest evil out of this war, you will never learn the violent deed and learn to overcome fighting what lies outside you. Therefore, it is good if you want this greatest evil with your whole heart. You are Christians and run after heroes and wait for redeemers who should take the agony on themselves for you and totally spare you Golgotha. But with that, you pile up a mountain of Cal Calvary over all Europe. If you succeed in making a terrible evil out of this war and throw innumerable victims into this abyss, this is good, since it makes each of you ready to sacrifice himself. For as I, you draw close to the accomplishment, accomplishment of Christ's mystery. You already feel the first, the fist of the iron one on your back. This is the beginning of the way. If blood, fire, and the cry of distress fill this world, then you will recognize yourself in your acts. Drink your, your fill of the blood, bloody atrocities of the war. Feast upon the killing and destruction. Then your eyes will open. You will see that yourselves are the bearers of such fruit. You are on your way if you will, if you will all this. Willing creates blindness, and blindness leads to the way. Should we w will error? You should not. But you do do will that error which you take the best truth at, which you take for the best truth, as men have always done. The symbol of the crystal signifies the unalterable law of events that come uh, of itself. In this seed, you grasp what is to come. I saw, I saw something terrible and incomprehensible. 
It was on the night of Christmas Day of the year 1913. I saw the peasant's boot, the sign of the horrors of the peasant war, of murdering and sen- diaries, and of bloody cruelty. I knew to interpret this sign for myself as nothing but the fact, fact that something bloody and dreadful lay before us. I saw the foot of a giant that crushed the whole city. How could I interpret this sign otherwise? I saw that the way to self-sacrifice began here. They will all become terribly enraptured by these tremendous experiences, and in their blindness we will want to understand them as outer events. It is an inner happening. That is the way to the perfection of the mystery of Christ, so that the peoples learn self-sacrifice. May the frightfulness become so great that it can turn men's eyes inward, so that they will no longer seek the self in others but in themselves. I saw it. I know that this is the way. I saw the de- death of Christ, and I saw his lament. I felt the agony of his dying, of the great dying. I saw a new God, a child who subdued demons in his hands. The God holds the separate principles in his power. He unites them. The God develops through the union of the principle in me. He is their union. If you will one of these principles, so you are in one, but far from your be- being other. If you, if you will both principles, one and the other, then you excite the conflict between the principles, since you cannot want both both at the same time. From this arises the need. The God appears in it. He takes your conflicting will in his hand, in the hand of a child, whose will is simple and beyond conflict. You cannot learn this. It can de- only develop you, develop in you. You cannot will it. Will this. It takes the will from your hand and wills itself. Will yourself that leads to the way. But fundamentally you are terrified of yourself, and therefore you prefer to run to all others rather than to yourself. I saw the mountain of the sacrifice, and the blood poured in streams from its sides. When I saw how pride and power satisfied men, how beauty beamed from the eyes of women when the great war broke out, I knew that mankind was on the way to self-sacrifice. The spirit of the deaths have seized mankind and forces self-sacrifice upon it. Do not seek the guilt here or there. The spirit of the deaths clutched the fate of man unto itself as it clutched mine. He leads mankind through the river of blood to the mystery. In the mystery, man himself becomes the two principles, the lion and the serpent. Because I also want my being other, I must become a Christ. I am made into Christ, I must suffer it. Thus the redeeming flows through the self-sacrifice. My pleasure is changed and goes above into its higher principle. Love is sighted, pleasure is blind. Both principles are in the symbol of the flame. The principles strip themselves of human form. The mystery showed me in images what I should afterward live. I did not possess any of those boons that the mystery showed me, for I still had to earn all of them. All right, so that is the end of Lever Novus. And um, just to conclude, um, pretty much Young is is um, talking about his own individuation process. And um, this is what we would call the the myth of the modern man. And pretty much um, because the God image kind of fell from heaven, we have to pretty much um, turn within ourselves and um, try and create our own myth or look for our own myth. And um, this is pretty much a process of... Um, of embracing both principles, right, evil and good, and um, trying to find a balance. balance. Um, and then um, I believe the word is here. Let me search this. Conscientus or something like that. Mysterium Contientus or... I seem to have find found I found what I was looking for. It's called Young's um, Conjunctio, and it reminds me of Cupid, who made people fall in love with a golden arrow, or the lesser known fact made them hate each other with a lead arrow. 
And um, so I have a photo here of a Magnolia. And um, with this lecture being over, I want to link, you, you send you guys to another video. Um, it's a video by um, Dr. Edward Edinger. It's a lecture on individuation. And um, you guys can check that out just to give you guys some more context to what individuation is. And with that being said, thank you for watching. Uh, I'll see you guys in the next episode.